Hey guys. This is part 4 of what if Naruto died and became a hollow. Hit like and subscribe if you like this one and also please check the author in the description. Let's start. We are pain, that's all. We are God. Chapter 13, La Le Suprema In life, if you asked Hitaki Kakashi what he thought the afterlife was, soul society would be the furthest answer from his mind. The silver-haired man never really thought about what the afterlife was before, but as soon as he was on the ground dying, he was forced to think about what would happen after he passed on. He was not expecting a young man in a black robe, barely seventeen years old, to appear before his spirit and use a sword to send him to the afterlife. What was his name again? Masaru? Whatever the case, that Shinigami kid had sent him to Soul Society, which turned out to be nothing like the paradise written down in all the religious texts. The man had spent little time in Rukangai though, as he quickly figured out that he become hungry, a trait that should not exist within the Soul Society. A local Shinigami visiting his home district explained to him that hunger was a sign of a strong Ryatsu and that those who possessed it had the potential to become a Shinigami. The Siriidei opened up a whole new world for the former ninja. The brief crash course given to him by Masaru was nowhere near enough to give him a broad understanding of the world, but as he applied to enroll in the Shinigami Academy, that all changed. He finished up the Shinigami Academy in two years, being a natural genius to this field of work just like when he was alive. He learned many different things all about the hollows, the swords of the Shinigami that were called Zanpakutu, and of Soul Society itself. He was entered into the always prestigious Godi 13 immediately after he graduated, into the 5th Division. It was fitting of course, Shinigami in the 5th Division were always known for their use in Kidu, and Kakashi had taken to Kida like he had to Ninjutsu. He got his first taste of a hollow soon after, and quite frankly it had disgusted him. Those beasts used everything at their disposal to get their food, and Kakashi was left with a nasty scar as a reminder of his first battle in the afterlife. He unlocked his shirkai in record time, and because of that, rose straight up to the eighth seed of his division within six months of being a part of the Godii 13. Being a seated officer was a whole new experience for him, as now he had the chance to interact with the higher ranks whom he had never interacted with before. And one of those individuals, came as a great shock to him. Flashback. Kakashi? Questioned a voice, its tone sounding slightly surprised. It was Kakashi's first day of being the eighth seat, and he already had to deal with more responsibilities and duties. He was on his way back from the 5th division's office, where he had just finished up organizing documents that the captain had assigned him to. Kakashi was confused at the sudden voice, and as he turned around to address its owner, his breath hitched in his throat, and he struggled to form a coherent sentence to say to this particular individual. Even standing in the same Shinigami robes as everyone else, the shock of spiky blonde hair instantly gave this man away. Namike's Minato, the fourth Hokage of Kanahigakur, had become a Shinigami. His gaze mirrored Kakashi's shocked glance, though there was a little bit of happiness in it. As sensei, Kakashi stuttered. The silver-haired man's emotions were a whirlwind of change. Ever since his death, he had earnestly hoped that his old comrades and dead loved ones would be somewhere in soul society, and he had hoped to reunite with at least one of them at all costs. But, due to the vast expanse of soul society, he didn't believe that he would ever run into one this soon, or that there would be any that would have become Shinigami. Kakashi's breathing quickened, and it increased even more when Minato his old student into a one-armed hug, signifying that he was indeed real. As sensei, you're a Shinigami as well? He asked. He returned the hug with his own, cementing the bond that the two men once had. Minato released Kakashi, smiled at him from arm's length away. Yeah, been here ever since I died nineteen years. The Shinigami saw great potential in me, and I completed my time in the academy in just one year. I've been the third seat in this division for the past five years. I've never been so thrilled to be working as a seated officer for this division. But, enough about me, I'll have to tell the others that you're a Shinigami too. Kakashi held his hands up in front of him, 
in a representative gesture that this was too much for him to take at one time. Wait, there are others from Kanoha here? Minato laughed. Oh yeah? Everyone's here. Tsunade, Jiraiya-sensei, the old man, Rin. We're all a tightly knit group here in the Siriidei. I figured that you would become a Shinigami as well, and Rin has been patiently been waiting for your arrival in Soul Society. And flashback. Kakashi smiled as he remembered that day, as it had been one of the happiest moments in his life. His old comrades, all Shinigami, and fairly talented ones at that. Immediately after they had finished their work that day, Minato had immediately taken him to see the rest of his comrades in life, and he was pleasantly surprised to see that there were quite a few of them. His old sensei explained to him that because they were former shinobi, and had at least some experience when using a type of spiritual energy, that they were much more likely to become shinigami than a normal human. To his fear, however, none of his younger comrades were present in the group. That meant one of two things, either that they were still alive, which is what he hoped, or that they were killed along with Kanoha's fall, and they had just never reunited with them. He had made his concerns known to his old sensei, but the man just laughed it off. Kakashi sighed, he was confident that his son was still alive, maybe even leading Kanoha as the next Hokage. He didn't know, none of them haven't been back to Kanoha in about a year, even though they knew it was back on its feet again. He had reintroduced him to all the comrades he hadn't seen in years, and how they were all faring since their deaths. His old teammate Rin was there, and she was first person he visited. She died at the tender age of 18, but despite having a relatively short period of time under her belt landed at the fourth seat of the third division. Two of the three Sanin were here as well, and thankfully it was the two that were actually decent, sometimes, people. Jiraiya finished the academy in two years, and was just recently promoted to the seventh seat of the ninth division. Tsunade was well noted for her prowess in the medical field, and was drafted as the sixth seat in the fourth division. The Sandane was placed in the most prestigious division of all, and quickly fell under Yamamoto's favor to become the fourth seat in the first division. Lastly, there was Uzumaki Kushina, who formed probably the best husband and wife team in all of Suryaidei. She rose to the third seat in the third division, being of the same rank as her husband. Kakashi smiled, times were good. He was supposed to meet up with all his comrades again soon, as they had formed their own Shinigami association, but first he was supposed to meet his sensei professionally right now. He opened the sliding door to the 5th division's barracks, knowing that this was where sensei was supposed to meet him. Kakashi suppressed a laugh as he entered. Minato was sitting at a desk with a giant stack of papers in front of him and an annoyed look on his face. Even in death, it seemed that a Hokage could never defeat his sworn enemy, paperwork. Minato's face brightened when he heard Kakashi enter the room, eager to get away from all the paperwork. Kakashi greeted him warmly, like he did on a regular basis, and Minato stood up from his chair to address him. Good afternoon, Sensei. Good afternoon to you as well, Kakashi. I have good news for you. Hiroko Fukutechu has presented that to the Central 46, and we both have an appointment with them that he's personally going to accompany us to. Minato said, a wide, giddy grin showing itself on his face. Kakashi's eyes widened substantially, before he smiled his patented eye smile. They've really considered it. I knew the captain would never let us down. If we can get the Central 46 to agree to this, imagine what good will be done in the future. This could mean a turning point for both the human world and the Siri IDI, Kakashi exclaimed. Minato fluidly agreed with him, but his face took on a more serious glance. The appointment is tomorrow afternoon at four o'clock. We need to be dressed in our finest robes, and give a speech so great that they'll be unable to refuse. We only have one shot at this Kakashi, the Central 46 won't accept the same thing twice. Kakashi nodded, his old professional instincts rapidly kicking in. Hiroko Fukutechu will be alerted of the time they want us there via Hell Butterfly. We must be in the vicinity so that he may find us, said Minato, as he glanced at two unranked Shinigami passing by, likely being done with work for the day. Kakashi left the barracks that day nervous, pleading for the Central 46 to open their hearts and accept their new proposal. Hiroko Shinji was a young Shinigami 
who was never known to be one who listened to authority. That being said, even he couldn't deny that the Central 46 was the supreme law of the land. If there was anything to be done in soul society, it was most likely the work of that infallible court system. So, when those two subordinates of his brought to him that crazy proposal of theirs, Shinji knew that the only way that was ever going to pass was if the Central 46 took action on it. Even the Sotaisha couldn't pass a ruling like that. He had to admit though, it wasn't a bad idea. It would be a shame for it not to pass, in order to ensure future members of the Godii 13. But, Shinji knew it wouldn't be that easy. The Central 46 was made up of stubborn old fools, proud of the stagnant old ways of the Syriidei, and unwilling to listen to anything that might change those things. People often said the Central 46 was judicial, but Shinji didn't see that honestly. Once a person is accused of a crime, the Central 46 judges them with such bias and harshness that there has never been a not guilty ruling in the history of the entire establishment. Thank God they weren't that harsh when it came to passing a law. Which, by the way, the Central 46 shouldn't even be doing in the first place, considering that they're not supposed to be a legislative body. But, if that's the way it had to be, then so be it. Two o'clock, the hell butterfly signaling their summons should have been here by now. Shinji walked over to his desk and sat down quietly. He wished he could be listening to some of that fancy new music that was popular in the real world right now. What's the name of that new music again? I think it's called Baroque, or something, muttered Shinji absent-mindedly. He rubbed the back of his head, and didn't even notice the hell butterfly fly right into his window. He whooped and fell out of his chair violently, when he opened his eyes and saw the pitch-black butterfly inches away from his face. The vice-captain groaned forcefully, as he struggled to his feet to catch the flying insect. Blah, 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 thought Shinji as the hell butterfly broadcasting their appointment, and how they should be honored to be in the Central 40 SIXS presence. He didn't have to go far to find Minato and Kakashi, as they already anticipated this, and were already waiting for the news in the next room over, waiting to meet the supreme law of the land. The underground compound of the Central 46 highly emphasized the near-paranoid approach the system had for restriction. The top portion of the building was above ground, surrounded by a large moat with only one key entrance into the compound. But the surface portion held next to nothing than the foyer. The judges and wise men even live underground, going to work every day at their assembly hall. It's unknown when the last time they saw the light of day was. Shinji had picked up the two former shinobi, guiding them through the gates of the restricted area into the main living quarters of the judges. Even he was nervous, as it was usually the captains who interacted with the Central 46, and here he was, a vice-captain, taking over all the work. Shinji led the charge into the assembly, vice-captain's badge gleaming proudly across his right arm to be displayed to anyone who crossed his path. He wasn't the only one who dressed for the occasion. Both Minato and Kakashi had dressed in their finest uniforms, and had managed to do something about their unruly hair. Kakashi also lost the face mask and it was the first time Shinji had ever seen his face. The light dimmed as the three made their way underground, and when they finally entered the main assembly hall, they saw the forty-six silhouettes vastly veiled by darkness. It was as if they were unknown deities sent to earth to judge, and could never reveal their faces to anyone as it would be too much for mortals to handle. Sit, boomed a voice from the highest portion of the hall, a vast echo making it seem much more intimidating than it actually was. The three Shinigami obeyed respectfully, bowing to their superiors as they took a seat at the benches on the lowest level of the floor. The forty-six men and women surrounded them from all sides, making it feel like they were being judged instead of proposing a law. This was it, thought Kakashi. These people hold supreme power over all of soul society. This one branch, oligarchical system was the only way to get something passed as a law. This political entity could make or break laws, without anything to balance out its power. There came a shuffling of papers directly ahead of the trio, where the six wise men had taken proceeding over the entire appointment. We've all read the proposal for this law, but I think you should explain in full detail why you believe that we should pass this. What you're suggesting could cost quite a lot of manpower to keep going, in addition to all the advanced technology costs. Minato was fully prepared for something like that to happen, 
giving a speech despite the paper explaining the entire proposal. He stood up from his seat, taking more initiative to talk than Kakashi. The reasoning behind it is simple. You may not know this, but Kakashi and myself are from that village that is mentioned in the paper. And we're not the only ones who came from there. Ever since our continent has been advancing, more and more former shinobi have been admitted into the Shinigami ranks. Minato paused in his speech for a moment, and he heard some slight murmuring coming from the group of judges. What's your point? asked the same wise man who spoke to them before. I'm inclined to believe that former shinobi are much more inclined to have suitable ryoku to become shinigami than normal humans. If you don't believe me, every one of us in our association have become seated officers in the span of about twenty years. However, ever since the hollows have discovered our little continent, due to our superior genetics, our village will become much more likely to become subject to hollow attack. We've managed to avoid this before because of our relative anonymity, but I've recently heard of a hollow attack three years ago that killed twelve humans and two shinigami. More murmuring. What we're proposing is more protection for the village of Kanahagakur no Sato. Despite our deaths, the will of fire still burns within us strong, and we will not allow our beloved village to be destroyed at the hands of hollows. We request that more Shinigami be sent on standby to the village, and protected at all costs to ensure its survival and future members of the Godii 13. You do realize that you want us to give unequal treatment to the humans, and place Shinigami in your village when they could be off somewhere else protecting another city or village. This sentence threw the three Shinigami for a slight loop. They didn't expect the Central 46 to say something like that, but it could be easily remedied. We're not that selfish. We want our village to be safe, but we don't want to deprive other people of protection if it means that our village will be safe. If we didn't know that more Shinigami would be coming out of Konoha, we wouldn't have proposed this idea in the first place. Minato raised his voice. There came a slight humming noise from the desks of the judges. Hmm, if what you say is true, then that single soul killed by a hollow could have been a captain. But we're not going to pass this law just yet. We'll need firm proof on your theory before we take action on this. You must show us that there really is a higher chance of becoming a Shinigami if one was a shinobi in life. Unfortunately, Ever since a certain incident, we cannot use our scientific institute for this. We will send word to the 4th Division via Hell Butterfly to run some tests on your association. A firm bubble of happiness rose in Minato and Kakashi's stomachs, and both smiled brightly at the judges. Shinji, on the other hand, just sat there quietly at the desk, casually watching the proceeding without making any judgment on it. But as soon as the court made that ruling, the vice captain stood up from the desk and with a quick bow to his superiors, walked out the door without a second thought. If there was one person Minato thought would be waiting for him outside the Central 46 compound, it would have to be his wife, Uzumaki Kushina. So, even though he half expected her to be sitting on the side of the wall patiently, he still embraced her warmly as if he would have never thought of that at all. Since the two had died together, the couple was fortunate enough to receive their consul at the same time as well as live their afterlife together. But, the days that went by missing their son grow up were painful indeed. Kushina herself never seemed to get over that they would likely be separated forever, and when Minato told her of his theory, her face brightened like he had never seen before, knowing that when Naruto became a Shinigami they would finally be reunited. Minato smiled softly at that. That's right, when he got here. His son would come to Soul Society eventually, and when he did, both he and Kushina had faith that he would be the finest Shinigami they had ever seen. Kushina! The blonde-haired man cried as he hugged her warmly. Even in death, Uzumaki Kushina looked as if she had barely changed. She was clad in the standard black Shinigami attire that everyone wore, though unlike many others, looked as if she hadn't aged a day since her death. Her ridiculous long red hair still went all the way past her knees, and she left it long and visible even though she tied it into a super long ponytail before combat. The woman laughed, knowing that such a warm embrace meant good news. Before Minato released her, she grabbed his collar and pulled the surprised Minato in for a long, chaste kiss. Minato didn't fight back, suddenly preferring the behavior. 
So, tell me the good news, she said eagerly when the married couple finally pulled away from each other. Minato grinned at her casually. The Central 46 has opened up to our proposal far easier than we expected. The only thing we have to do is prove that former shinobi have a greater ryoku than normal people. They've sent a hell butterfly out to the 4th Division to run some tests on the members of our association. Kushina's smile dampened slightly at those words, but she couldn't deny that things were invariably working in their favor. The others are waiting to hear about this big proposal that you and Kakashi have covered up. You promised them that you'd tell them as soon as you were done with your meeting. Are you going to tell them that they have to go through a bunch of medical tests as well, she said, some sternness entering her voice. Minato waved his hands in front of his face. Don't worry, I'll tell them. I wanted this to be a surprise, but somehow I think that we're all going to be doing medical testing will put a damper on that. Kushina glared at him playfully. What was your first clue? She asked sarcastically. Minato thought the group took the news surprisingly well. Before they all went and beat the shit out of him for putting medical tests on them. But nevertheless they complied to it, as the proposal was too sweet of a deal for them to pass up. Ever since they had died, every single one of them had to put up with thinking whether or not the village was safe. It was an aggravating experience, to say the least, but now they wouldn't have to put up with that anymore. Of course, now here they were outside in the 4th Division's waiting room all of them sending a death glare over in his direction. Kushina was the only one to not finish being tested, and all the others had marks to prove that they were already done. Minato laughed nervously, which in turn caused the atmosphere to become even more tense. The man got up out of his chair, before walking away from the tense atmosphere to go watch the 4th Division Shinigami finish up their work. He touched a portion of his arm, feeling a slight stinging course through it. That was where the doctors had taken a Ryatsa sample for testing, but it wasn't so simple to figure out whether they were genetically superior. He heard a slight whirring of an operation taking place, and Minato hoped it wasn't coming from his beloved wife's room. But to his relief, the doctor was finishing up in her room. The medical specialist had just inserted an otoscope into his wife's right ear just as he had entered the room. Looks all clear, muttered the doctor as he looked down Kushina's ear canal. Minato didn't know whether he was talking about the proposal or his wife's ear canal. But whatever the case, the doctor always finished off with a small checkup, meaning that Kushina was almost good to go. The medical Shinigami took off his gloves once he finished with a few more things, and then turned to address Minato. You're the one who proposed that plan, aren't you third seat Namikaze? He asked rhetorically. Well, right now it looks like you people do have a disposition to become Shinigami but we'll have to run a few tests on your Ryoku and blood to prove it. We'll send the results to the Central 46 in about a week's time, so you should hear from them soon. The doctor explained. Both Minato and Kushina smiled brightly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanked Minato heartily. The doctor laughed slightly at their attitudes. No, no, thank you. For ensuring future members of the Godii 13. Your association deserves the high praise it gets from the higher-ups, third seat Namikes. You have some fine Shinigami in there, that's for sure. Both Minato and Kushina left the doctor's office that day feeling brisker and happier than they had in years. Six days later, the wise men of the Central 46 observed the results of the testing as soon as they were sent by the 4th Division. In front of them were two sets of papers. One was the original rough draft proposal of the law that was sent in by those at the 5th Division. The second was the final drafted law that the Central 46 spent crafting, the only necessary now was its seal of approval. Minato and Kakashi were called back to their headquarters to watch them give their final decision on the matter. The leading wise man looked over the results down to every last detail, studying the normal Shinigami's Ryoka sample versus the Kanoha Shinigami's Ryoka sample. The 4th Division's report lasted around five pages, and they were all being passed around the table of the six wise men. The other five wise men looked at their head, who was cautiously scanning the last page with a thoughtful expression on his face. The tension in the air was stifling to the former Kanoha ninja down below, and their stomachs contracted as the six wise men began whispering to each other in a group. The proposal of course had a hefty price, Minato realized that as he wrote it. 
They didn't want to sound too important, but both he and Kakashi requested that a captain be sent to Soul Society in case of an incredibly strong hollow. After a moment of silence, where even the forty judges had turned to stare at them, the group finally broke away from each other, the head wise man clearing his throat and grabbing one of the two stamps that sealed the fate of a law. By the power vested in me by all of the Syriidei, and by the power vested in me by all of the forty judges and six wise men that sit here today, the supreme authority of soul society, the central forty-six, hereby declares this law approved. To cement his point, the head wise man brought down the stamp on the document, stamping an enormous, red kanji for approved all over the face of the paper. Minato felt a blossom of happiness emerge inside his stomach, before he laughed disbelievingly. He sat up from his chair and went over to clap Kakashi across the back, who seemed to be in as big a daze as he was. The forty-six members of the court watched them celebrate with stoic faces, deciding not to impede on their moment of happiness. The village of Kanahigakur was now fully underneath the protection of the Godii 13. It took a little while for Naruto to finally rise from unconsciousness back into the real world. Somehow, he hadn't gotten attacked by a passing hollow on the lookout for a meal, and he supposed that itself was a godsend. The wounded hollow rose to his feet, feeling slightly delirious and bloated. If said hollow did in fact come by here, then he'd be in no shape to fight them off unless they were of a weak kind of hollow. Still, Naruto wondered just how he survived his encounter with Barrigan. He didn't know much about the old king, but he knew enough about him to realize that Barrigan wasn't one to take mercy on anyone. Naruto dizzily looked back at the great palace one last time. There was no way he was going back in there now, at least before he gained the power necessary to challenge Barrigan. Thinking back, his original goal for coming to Lost No Chase was that he wanted to gain the capability necessary to take on the Shinigami. But now he realized he was being nothing but a naive fool. His little excursion had cost him three years of his life, which he could have easily spent destroying Konoha. And thinking about it now, he had really lost sight of his dream over the past few years. Maybe it was on account of being a hollow, and needing to fulfill his natural needs? Naruto didn't know, but he realized now he didn't need an army to take down Konoha. There were likely Shinigami stationed there, but he likely take them now that he was in Ajuchis. Before that, they had seemed so strong that he had thought he would need help defeating, but he realized that wasn't true. He had just been a fledgling hollow then, and he had gained so much strength since then. He would go back to Konoha soon, he would defeat whatever Shinigami was stationed there, and destroy Konoha now when he couldn't before. He would no longer have to escape to here through a garganta. But first, he needed to recuperate from his wounds, and find a suitable shelter to hide from Hueco Mundo's many predators. He cursed himself right now for not having an advanced hollow's regeneration, but he figured he would develop that later on. The Shinigami could wait. Barrigan could wait. His own kingdom could wait. Now was the time to focus on Konoha, his original goal. Naruto limped off into the darkness of Hueco Mundo, thoroughly set on succeeding. Chapter 14, Valakav The infinite expanse of Hueco Mundo was quiet, and not even a gentle breeze flowed through the merciless sands of the desert. The perpetual moon hung over the world, its light and glory acting as a guiding light. Naruto thought it looked as beautiful as ever, but maybe the delirium was making it seem that way. Naruto's bones ached every time he so much as took a single step, and several times he had to lean on one of the quartz trees for support. Too much walking, and bile and blood would rise up in his throat and he would wheeze so strongly that he looked like a medical patient taking his last breaths at a hospital. But there were no hospitals in Hueco Mundo, nothing more than vast, untamed wild. An injured hollow could be wiped out in seconds, as the hollows who lived here never gave a damn what their condition was like. The white sand crunched beneath his feet, and Naruto was looking down at his legs. He noticed that the deep crimson armor that covered his entire person had changed to little more than a dull red. The bony material looked blotchy as well, as if he had bled underneath the armor. He heard the roar of a distant hollow, and noted that Hueco Mundo had an exceptionally sparse population today. Maybe it was because he was around Las Noches, a place that most hollows tended to avoid. He wasn't out of the woods yet, 
as around a vast circumference of Las Noches there stood several outposts and underground bunkers, their marble pieces looking like little more than ruins left on the landscape, instead of districts separate from the main body of Las Noches. The east side of Las Noches, where the Ajuchas had left, was fortunately filled with little more than rundown and abandoned outposts that had few sentries that were stationed there. The old stone bricks had fallen off their structures, and the marble of the bunker looked old and cracked. As Naruto limped through the distant reaches of Las Noches, he continuously looked over his right shoulder, cautiously checking whether anyone was following him. To both his relief and disappointment, the following never occurred whenever he was around the vicinity of Las Noches. A few weak hollows had attacked him during his trek, but even in his injured state he was able to fend them off easily. Feeding on such weak hollows at this point in his evolutionary lifestyle would grant him nothing. He found a small cave in a series of rock beds, and being a small hollow, the Ajuchas was able to squeeze into the shelter to avoid the strong wind and allow his injuries to heal. The cave was mostly out of view, so he was mostly safe from attacks by other hollows. He found the softest section of dirt in the cave, and curled up into to go to sleep, despite knowing that there was no need to other than to make his wounds heal faster. Listening to the wind move the sand always did calm him, and numb the aching pain that he was currently feeling. He just lied there for over an hour, listening to it rise and fall in intensity, and never even budging from that spot, before finally drifting off into a light sleep. Hey, look at this, guys. There was a small Ajuchus who thought it would just be fine to sleep out here in the middle of Hueco Mundo. I don't think it knows the dangers of resting in this place, came an obnoxious hollow, its voice tinted with disbelieving glee. Especially since we're here, it added arrogantly. This is our lucky break, then. The chances that we would ever get to eat someone like him is slim to none. Let's eat now, before he gets up. We could all take a huge step in our evolutionary line came another voice, as eager and gleeful as the first. Four hollows. Going by the stupid laughter of all of them, thought Naruto, who was easily roused from his sleep the instant they came within fifty feet of his cave. Let's eat then. I'll deliver a fatal blow right to the mask, and then we can all dig in, said the first voice. The large, tan hollow brought down its beefy, fat fist down directly where Naruto's head was. A cloud of dust and sand rose inside the cave, and the hollow's happiness turned to confusion as all that was left after the dust cleared was a small crater where the tan hollow's fist had impacted. The first hollow roared as he felt a heavy weight latch itself onto his back, pulling him downwards with a force that he couldn't compete with. He saw the fox hollow, awake and moving like he had never been asleep, staring down at him manically as soon as he was moved into a position where he could see. Nice to meet you. I'm Uzumaki Naruto, and you would really be quite the rude ones if had come here intending to disturb my sleep. But that would be beyond such fine hollows such as yourselves, wouldn't it? Naruto asked, his face twisted into a look of pure loathing. The three hollows that surrounded him did nothing, but the one that Naruto was holding hostage was nodding his head frantically. Well, that's just Andy, knowing that you aren't the type of hollows who would do such a thing. He pushed harder on the hollow forcing it to grunt in pain. But it turns out I would have so much more respect for you if I hadn't known you to be liars. Naruto hissed harshly, digging his sharp claws into the flesh of the captured hollow. I find lying hollows to be among the tastiest beings I can sample. He lied, knowing that there were next to no difference in the taste. And you would have lived much longer if you hadn't thought of attacking an ajuchas. Asleep or not, that was one of the most idiotic moves you could pull. The hollow stammered for a reply, but Naruto narrowed his eyes accusingly. He raised one of his front paws, making sure to keep the other one grabbed onto the hollow. The hollow's pitiful life flashed before its eyes as it viewed the potent black claws propelled towards him at a rate he wasn't very comfortable with. It gurgled as the claws penetrated its sturdy skin, and red life fluid poured from its jugular in torrents. Naruto had gone for a clean kill this time but that didn't make the action any less agonizing to him. The hollow's companions stared dumbly as the spectacle unfolded, but one of them found his throat slit mere seconds after his friend has died, the fox ajuchas appearing next to him as quick as a blur. A pause, and then another thud as the corpse of the hollow fell to the ground directly after the first one. 
The two remaining live hollows were finally able to gather their composure, but as soon as they were prepared to launch an attack, Naruto had used his superior strength to send their heads flying clean off their body. Amazingly, the two hollows were still alive for a few seconds, their bodies falling limp to the ground, yet their heads attempting to roar in a gesture of pure horror. But even in their last seconds of life, Naruto wouldn't let them have any reprieve, as immediately after he ripped off their heads with his claws, he began tearing into the hollow's severed heads with his teeth. Naruto enjoyed a quick meal after that, even going so far to mock his enemies after death and giggle obnoxiously as well. The brief fight had left him in a happier mood, and as he looked into the endless night ahead of him he felt the powerful urge to explore. There was something odd dotted on the landscape far, far ahead of him, but he couldn't figure out what it was. As he drew ever closer, his vision could make out more of what lay ahead of him. It looked like a giant hole from his perspective, but it wasn't until he actually reached the place that he figured out it was an enormous canyon. And what a canyon it was! Absolutely gargantuan, putting even the Grand Canyon in the human world to shame. It took Naruto's breath away, and traces of his old self found their way into his eyes. He knew that he had to explore this canyon. He looked down, seeing sharp rocks at the bottom of a steep, sharp and dangerous cliff face. There were no apparent trails, footholds, or outlying rocks that could be used for leverage. Any fool who tried to tackle this beast would surely be in for a painful death at the bottom. At least, any fool that was human. Naruto stood on his hind legs and puffed out his chest, looking incredibly ridiculous with the drab background. He did a kooky, immature little dance, and recklessly leapt off the gorge without any hesitation. He fell for a while, calmly humming to himself as if he wasn't falling several thousand feet. As he neared the wall, his hind legs shot out from behind him, and his powerful claws dug into the rock. He saw a burrowing hollow at the bottom out of the corner of his eye, but it never resurfaced again. He also saw a strange thing. It almost looked like some kind of building, but its ruined structures seemed to deny that is the case. Naruto dropped onto the sand with a light grunt and was able to get a closer look at the so-called building. It was red in color and looked like a tall tower, or at least it would have if 90% of the building wasn't strewn all over the place. It looked like someone had taken an enormous blade and just slashed the tower in half and then into even smaller segments. Naruto was mystified by the thing, his curiosity getting the better of him yet again. He dragged his quadrupedal body across the sand eyes fixated on nothing but the red building. He stubbed his toe on something, making him curse in pain and lose his focus. Directly in front of the tower, there was a tan point rising above the landscape for about six inches. Naruto cautiously bent over and reached out his paw to touch the thing, rubbing his pads all over it. It was rough, and Naruto recognized the material as a type of stone brick, a stark contrast to the building that lay in front of him. Naruto felt the rough surface for a few more seconds before forcefully retracting his paw and digging it into the sand beneath the stone object. Naruto dug around at a phenomenal rate, his claws working in perfect tandem together. Within a few minutes, Naruto had uncovered the entire thing. It hung underground at a lopsided angle, and it turned out that it laid level, it would be a completely flat surface. A wall. Naruto muttered to himself. The stone object was indeed once a part of a wall. There was only one layer of bricks, but many rows and columns that rose to a great height. He reached out to touch it again, rubbing his hands across a strange insignia that looked like ten uniform swirls. A strange shadow entered Naruto's vision, and his instincts made him jerk around instantaneously, thoroughly prepared for any sort of fight. The shadow seemed to be coming from the interior of the Red Tower, but Naruto wasn't able to make out what it was. He cautiously stepped up towards the tower, his nerves shot as he entered the inside. He sensed movement for a split second, and he shot down the hallway of the tower as blinding speeds, intent on catching who was spying on him. The tower seemed to lead him underground, and he would have found it odd that this place was a massive underground complex rather than a tower. The hallways became more and more dungeon-like, extinguished torches lining the walls and dead ends becoming more common. He reached a winding set of stairs after running into about six dead ends, and he caught a glimpse of the shadow as he neared the end of the stairwell. It was rocking back and forth rhythmically, 
almost like it was luring the young Ajuchas. But the shadow disappeared as he reached the end of the hall, but he was finally capable of seeing its owner as he entered the chamber at the end of the staircase. It was a shrouded figure, dressed in a black cloak and stood about seven feet tall. But the thing that Naruto noticed most was the fact that it stood upright. A vast O Lord, Naruto assumed, and although it was likely the case, Naruto desperately hoped that he was wrong. The Vasto Lord didn't even need to turn around to notice Naruto's presence. Rather, he continued to sit there as if Naruto wasn't there, staring at the hollow mask, and then eventually at the ruined walls and the sand floor. Naruto stared dumbly as the Vasto Lord finally got up, but ignored Naruto even if he tensed up for a fight. The powerful being took a few minutes to create a small hole big enough for the mask, before casually dropping it in and giving the dead hollow a proper burial. The Vasto Lord sighed to himself. Well, don't just stand there with that retarded look on your face, kid, he said, addressing Naruto for the first time. Naruto snapped out of his reverie at that remark. Retarded? Who the fuck are you to say I'm retarded? You're a freaking Vasto Lord, who does nothing more than sit in the basement of an abandoned tower staring at hollow masks all day. The Vasto Lord ignored him, and to Naruto's frustration, was now staring at the ground again, his eyes half-lidded as if he were bored. Finally, he spoke. Yeah, you're right, he admitted. The powerful hollow finally took off his cloak, revealing his true appearance for the first time. His skin coloring was a stark, clammy gray, with hideous buboes and appendages sticking out from everywhere on his body. Six spikes were encircled around his collar, almost looking like a necklace of bones. His mask was devilish, with an angular chin and curved horns coming out of the forehead of the white porcelain. His eyes were mustard yellow, much like every other hollow in the world, yet they were sad and somber, though they were slanted with anger as well. Ugly gray hairs were poking out of the back of his mask, and they came down to form long spikes down his back. The Vasta Lord glared at the weaker hollow, and Naruto felt one of the most oppressive atmospheres he had ever experienced in his life. You could practically taste the bitterness that oozed off of the Vasta Lord. This is my kingdom, he hissed at Naruto, who responded to that declaration with more than a little confusion. Your kingdom? Naruto asked. He didn't like to just sit here and chit-chat with the hollow, but it was a miracle that he hadn't been attacked yet. Maybe he could prolong this long enough for him to escape. The Vasta Lord sauntered on up to Naruto and tightly gripped his shoulder which prevented Naruto from escaping. My kingdom, he repeated, staring into Naruto's eyes. The Vasta Lord released his grip after that, turning his back to Naruto. Your kingdom. Naruto paused. This place is nothing more than a bunch of ruins now. Outside the tower, I saw this stone wall with a strange insignia on it. There are probably more of them underground, and you're telling me that this place is your kingdom? Naruto asked. The Vasta Lord tensed even further. It was my kingdom, he whispered, though Naruto still heard it easily. A small snort of a chuckle came from Naruto, and it obvious that he was trying so hard not to laugh. On the inside, he wanted to do nothing more than burst into peals of laughter and insult and mock the Vasta Lord for the loss of his kingdom. But he knew that this hollow was leagues ahead of him, and to laugh would be tantamount to suicide. But the Vasta Lord ignored that short little outburst. Naruto was lucky that he was a relatively patient Vasta Lord. But my kingdom was destroyed by that bastard Barrigan. I thought the rough terrain and deep hole would offer a suitable terrain obstacle for a hollow kingdom to exist at the bottom of this canyon, but apparently that isn't the case as Barrigan used his superior numbers to crush ours. I was the only one left alive, and I lament the loss of my kingdom every day. Naruto turned all serious for a moment. Does Barrigan enjoy destroying small kingdoms? He asked. The Vasto Lord snorted at that. Enjoy it? He lives for it. If the son of a bitch goes for too long without sending his army on anyone, then he becomes cranky, the Vasto Lord said. Naruto looked confused, as if he were about to inquire how he knew this. The Vasto Lord sighed. I suppose I'll tell you my name then. It's Valakav Almazan, but I highly doubt you've ever heard of me, as if he just answered his own question, 
the Ajuchas in front of him shook his head. I was once best friend and champion of Berrigan, meaning that I was also second in command within Las Noches. But, as time went on, I began to see a severe problem with my leader's arrogance and ways. I was selfish, and I began to crave power, supreme power all for myself. It didn't help that I was sadistic and impulsive at the time. Eventually, I left Lost No Chase and Berrigan behind, and started my own kingdom at the bottom of this canyon, far away from Lost No Chase. Naruto seemed shocked and angry about this revelation. About three years ago, I began to look for my successor. I saw you rise up from the underground Minos forest when I was wandering Hueco Mundo. You and that bug Ajuchas were planning to go to Las Noches. You in particular. I saw a very likely candidate to be my successor. But of course there were others, but they're all dead now, and that's what I thought happened to you as well when you entered Las Noches and never came out. But, in the three years that you were trapped in Las Noches, everything changed. Still being the sadistic and brash hollow that I was at the time, I foolishly decided that I had the necessary manpower to attack Las Noches. I lead my army up the canyon and to the palace, but we were all crushed before we could even reach Berrigan's throne room. After that incident, I had revealed myself to Berrigan, and his rage knew no bounds as he took advantage of our weakness to deal a devastating blow here on the home front. I don't know why you're explaining all of this to me. In case you haven't noticed, I'm not exactly the nicest hollow in the world, so if you're looking for sympathy you've come to the wrong place, Naruto said rudely. Valakav allowed a ghost of a grin to come upon his face. It's true. I might just be an old hollow that's begging for sympathy. There's no kingdom for you to take over anymore, and I'm not even sure you would want to do that in the first place, he said bitterly. Naruto turned away from him. Well, you just happen to be in luck. I had a little run-in with the king of Las Noches, and now it's my goal to surpass his kingdom with my own. However, even if I do create my own kingdom, I wouldn't be your successor. I'm not going to have my spirit break like yours did, nor am I going to have my kingdom collapse. By having both of those things happen to you, you're just a pathetic old Vasto lord who isn't even deserving of my sympathy. You were better off as Barrigan's champion. Valakav stared at the boy with more than a little bit of resentment, to which Naruto ignored. Besides, I have a greater goal in mind that would be wasted on the likes of you. The destruction of Kanahigaku no Sado, in the elemental countries, and the complete annihilation of the Shinigami race. That is my true final goal, not some small backwater kingdom at the bottom of a canyon. Naruto turned his back on the fallen king, finally having had enough of him, and ascending the stairs. Velikav's mind went numb for a minute, before a sort of epiphany happened. Kanahagakur? This kid wants to destroy the Kanahagakur. He can't be talking about another village. There's only one Kanahagakur in the world. Wait, kid. You can't go destroy Kanoha right now. Doing that is the same thing as suicide. He yelled out to Naruto, who paused in his ascension to stare intensely at Valakav. What was that? Are you telling me that destroying Kanoha is beyond my capabilities? He roared in anger. Valakav had apparently hit a very sore spot for Naruto. It was basically telling the boy that he was too weak. But the rage was short-lived and faded to become suspicion. Come to think of it, how do you even know about Kanoha in the first place? Anyone who isn't from the elemental countries should have no knowledge of it. The two were silent for a moment. Who are you? Valakav was avoiding Naruto's gaze, as if something nasty from his past had come back to haunt him. T that doesn't matter, he said after a moment, making himself seem even more suspicious. All I know is that the village of Kanoha has recently come underneath the protection of the Shinigami. If you attack now, you'll have to be fighting a great amount of Shinigami all by yourself. They also have the ability to call captains or vice-captains to the scene on a whim and that's something that an Ajuchas like yourself can't fight. Valakav explained. Naruto looked conflicted after hearing those words. Should he believe the old hollow? Or was he just pulling stuff out of his ass to keep him here? That would explain all the stuttering and the obvious lying he was doing before. Fuck you. Naruto said hotly, his voice raising to a squeak and a forced, overly happy grin on his face. 
was said Valakav. I said fuck you, asshole. I don't have to believe your bullshit. You're a former king, and that makes you a liar by default. You're telling me that Kanoha gets all this special treatment for no reason? That's downright laughable. At best there will be a few low-ranked Shinigami stationed there, whom I can easily take out with no problem. You don't understand, said Valakav stoically. No, I do understand Valakav. You're just trying to make me give up on my dreams so you can build me up as your successor to stroke your own pathetic ego. Well, guess what old man, I'm going to go to Kanoha right now, destroy it, and prove to you that I'm fully capable. Naruto's voice cracked on the last sentence. I've been wanting to practice how to do this, anyway, said Naruto, as he opened up the garganta and stepped into the black void. Valakav held out his hand. Wait, don't. See ya, Valakav. Don't die before I get back. I want to prove to you my capabilities. With a sinister laugh, the garganta closed before Valakav could even react, leaving nothing but normal space where the void once was. Valakav sat down on the sand in frustration, his body wavering. Stupid fool. The garganta opened high above Kanoha, where even the Kanoha monument could be seen at a bird's eye view. The hollow within immediately stepped out of the garganta as soon as he saw the blue sky, eager to wreak some havoc on the denizens below. He hovered in the air for a moment, looking down on the village from his standpoint. It looked so peaceful, as if it wasn't even being affected by the war that was currently going on with IWA. Children played in the streets, vendors smiled and sold goods to their valued customers. Shinobi, Jenin or Kage alike were treated with full respect. But most importantly, not a single one of them was unaware of the monster in the skies, ready to slit their throats at a moment's notice. Naruto stared down on the village with a hungry look in his eyes, like an evil deity preparing to rain down his judgment on the foolish mortals. He ran a paw across his mask, stroking the back of its ears to the bottom of his chin. Well, he sighed wistfully. Let's get on with it then. Chapter 15 Infallibilidad the average citizen in Kanoha did not realize that they were all being watched by a powerful, unseen force from beyond the grave. That might not necessarily be a good thing, as it means that any Shinigami who was stationed there could take whatever they wanted of how much they wanted. Such was the case for many of the more corrupt and arrogant Shinigami, who were annoyed that they had to come to this backwater village in the first place. They were elite Shinigami, they all thought, and it was above them to guard this little village from whatever weak hollows that would attack it. One of the Shinigami, a six-foot-tall bald male who was currently stationed on the roof of the Hokage mansion was probably the most prominent in this line of thought. He thought he was God, but in actuality he was such a pathetic loser that stating his name would be insulting to everyone who was reading this story. He currently laid in a reclined position on the shambles of the red roof, eating the food he stole from a nearby tea shop. I don't see what's so special about this place, or why we need to protect a shithole like it. He muttered, chewing the dango he had stolen directly off someone else's plate. The Shinigami laid back and put his hands behind his head. We've had nothing but weak hollows ever since we came here. Discovering this tiny little continent has been nothing but trouble. It just gives us more area that we have to protect. If I had my way, I would stop protecting the humans— and leave them to their deaths at the hands of the hollows. He said out loud, chortling piggishly at the thought of humans dying, but his expression changed dramatically when he saw a little blip of something high in the sky. What's that? He asked, cracking an eye open at the thing, which seemed to be rapidly falling towards earth. He stumbled to his feet clumsily, drawing his zanpakutu in response. But the shinigami was caught off guard when the blip of something disappeared from view in a blur. Why he asked in confusion, before an extraordinary feeling of pain had rocketed through his entire being. The wounded Shinigami's eyes widened when he saw a small ajuchas, barely bigger than him directly behind him, its grotesque red arm thrust through his abdomen. The dying Shinigami screamed in pain as the hollow seemed to grab hold of his innards with its sharp claws. His entire world went black as the ajuchas ripped his innards straight out of his body, clutching a large chunk of his small intestine in his right claw. Naruto grinned in pleasure, as he held the slimy, bleeding organ in his paw. He enjoyed shifting from his quadrupedal form to a more bipedal stance, if only so he could perform a move like that. 
Ooh, this small intestine would look nice on me, don't you think? He asked the heir. Without waiting to receive an answer, he wrapped the uncoiled bit of intestine around his neck so that it looked like a hideous, bloody scarf. A makeshift human article of clothing on nothing more than a vicious, bloodthirsty monster. Naruto stood on his hind legs, striking a ridiculous pose before doing a little erratic jig on the rooftop. He was already having so much fun, and he hadn't even started on the villagers yet. He turned back to the dead Shinigami. Well, does it look good on me, sir? He paused for a moment and received no answer. Well, does it? He asked. He bent down over the dead Shinigami. Hey, why aren't you answering me? Is it because you're dead? You can't take that excuse. I need you to tell me how good your small intestine looks on me. Need I remind you that I'm giving you every opportunity to answer. So do it, or I'll kill you, again. He whined. When he received no answer, he growled and kicked the corpse of the Shinigami off the roof, and watched it plummet down to the streets below. He ripped the scarf from his neck, before throwing it down to join its master. He knew the only reason he did that was because looking around the village made him furious. In the three years that he had been away, the village had made a full recovery, when he knew full well they didn't deserve such a thing. Indeed, Danza's face had been added to the only remaining space on the mountain and there were many more buildings in the villages as they had built outwards to become something more resembling of a real capital. Those weren't the only changes, however. Every building looked a little nicer, a little cleaner, as if the entire standard of living in the village had improved while he had been away. Gone was the grubby little apartment complex where he had lived, and in its place sprung up a sophisticated hotel, which became a popular resort for ambassadors visiting the village. Naruto never saw the new building that had appeared. All he saw was his old apartment, and all the bad memories that accompanied it. More and more bad memories went into his head, a new one in place as soon as he had rid himself of the old one. It will all be over soon, Naruto thought to himself, and then I'll never have to think about this shithole ever again. His attention set itself upon the building whose roof he was currently sitting on, and the image of Danza sitting at his desk, Plotting the next use of his chakra popped into his head. The desire to rip the old man a new one blossomed in his head, but he restrained himself from carrying out that desire. The old fool must wait, for now. Later, after he witnesses his pathetic village get destroyed, without even knowing the cause. Even after reassuring himself of that fact, the Ajuchas could only barely resist going to kill Danza first. This would be the last time he would ever see this continent he lamented while looking at the street below. All of his affairs from after this point would exist in the afterlife, as a hollow who fought soul society. So, he might as well make this as fun as possible. He breathed in the fresh Kanoha air, before loosely jumping down onto the street below. Ever since the institution of experimental and scientific research had mysteriously disappeared off the map, the Shinigami were forced to use other methods than the Institute's technology to locate hollows. What they did nowadays was gather the best Ryatsa sensors in the world, and place them at specific sites around the specific area. The sensors would pick up on a hollow's Ryatsu, and alert the other Shinigami via a flare. If the hollow was too strong for them to handle, they would send a hell butterfly back to Soul Society requesting backup. The system wasn't too inefficient to be honest, and with the increased security on this particular village, it meant that backup called would consist of nothing less than high-level Shinigami. And it just so turned out that the Ryatsa sensor for the Konoha sector was picking up on some hollow activity. Big hollow activity too, if the large Ryatsa was ever an indicator. Just feeling it sent his nerves on edge, and he fumbled to perform some kidda that would alert the others of the hollow's presence. Whatever the case, he just knew that this was going to be one hell of a fight. The other eleven Shinigami froze as they saw the red beam of Kida light up the sky. A hollow was either in the village or approaching it, a rare occurrence in its own right. But orders from the higher-ups explained that there might be a sudden spike of hollow attacks in this area. Most of the Shinigami couldn't settle the feeling that this just might be the beginning. The Shinigami met their Ryatsa sensor at the center of the village, where he had sent off the flare. He looked unsettled at something that had occured. Maeda. What's wrong? asked a young, 
reliable-looking male Shinigami that was leading the others to their destination Maeda didn't respond to him. Instead he gradually rose a shaky hand and pointed down at the streets below. The Shinigami tensely turned around to look where Maeda was pointing, and noticed a small fox hollow lumbering through the streets of Kanoha. It seemed to be contemplating what was to be attacked first. It didn't look that threatening by hollow standards, but the Shinigami could see several key traits that gave away what it was. Ejuches, said Maeda fearfully. As soon as they heard that word and looked upon the beast stalking the streets below them, all breath hitched in their throat. Ten of the Shinigami seemed to be struggling for words, though the leader seemed to be transfixed at the Ejuches. W what do we de do, Kuroki? asked Maeda. Kuroki snapped his head back into place, going serious in less than a second. Sasaki, call for backup immediately and get a captain or vice-captain out here. This is something that is out of our league, he ordered, appearing frustrated when Sasaki paused to respond to him. Go, Sasaki. Quit dawdling and send a hell butterfly to Soul Society, right now, he bellowed. W what do we do in the meantime, Kuroki? asked a female Shinigami somewhere behind him. Kuroki stared intensely at the Ajuchas below wanted nothing more than to flee the scene and watch their superior deal with things. But, inwardly, he knew that he couldn't do that. Not as long as that Ajuchas was sauntering down, putting lives at risk. We will engage the target. Naruto just didn't know where to begin. It was he like a little boy roaming around a candy store, and having complete and unlimited access to everything available. All these people were sheep. No, they lower than sheep as they didn't even realize that the big, bad wolf was here to come and eat them. Ooh, what's that over here? he said, noticing a feeble old man that was barely able to stand. He contemplated eating him first, but his attention was drawn away from the old man and onto a few academy students that were bounding through the village playing their game of ninja. Ooh, maybe I should eat them first. Naughty children need to be punished, after all, he chuckled at the thought, before he spotted a young mother and her baby rolling through the village. Jackpot. She'd make a fine first meal, he exclaimed, as he sped over to the woman and child. Kuroki noticed this immediately from his position on the rooftop. Wait a minute. He's made a move, and is going for that woman and her baby, he exclaimed, frantically drawing his zanpakutu. In a desperate attempt to save the mother and child, he used Chunpa to get over there like a man possessed ignoring the cries of concern from his teammates. Not quick enough. I won't make it, he thought as he witnessed the hollow almost on the oblivious woman. Time to eat. Naruto laughed ridiculously, opening his mouth in an attempt to tear into the woman's flesh. He did tear into some flesh, but it wasn't the kind that he was expecting at that moment in time. There, right in front of him protecting the two humans, stood a tall, lanky-looking Shinigami with his zanpaka to drawn. The black-clothed death god had used his own body to prevent him from eating the woman, which would explain why his teeth were currently sunk deeply into the Shinigami's shoulder. The Zanpakuta fell uselessly from the Shinigami's hands, and Naruto heard voices come from on top of a rooftop some ways away. He glanced over there while keeping a firm grip on the Shinigami, and noticed around ten other Shinigami all congregated in a group, apparently worrying over their now-wounded comrade. The Shinigami weakly raised his free arm, pushing on the hollow's mask in an attempt to buy time for the mother and child. Naruto growled in anger as the resistance, and slowly yet forcefully bit down harder on the Shinigami's shoulder. The Shinigami yelled in pain when he began to feel his bones snap under the intense pressure the fox was exerting on him. Naruto had had quite enough fucking around, and tore the piece of shoulder flesh straight from Kuroki's body. Kuroki screamed in pain as he crumpled to the ground blood gushing from the fatal wound in torrents. Naruto munched on the mixture of muscle, bone, and sinew, his satisfaction for the meal steadily calming his rage. Kuroki's vision was beginning to fade, and the last thing he ever saw was the hideous image of the fox ajuches chewing on his flesh, fresh red blood dribbling down his mask and neck. Still, Kuroki felt oddly at ease despite the horrible display, feeling a degree of warmth that came from rescuing that woman and her child. Naruto noticed the Shinigami had passed away now, but there was no time for him to relish in a fine meal of Shinigami. His currently living comrades were calling out their dead comrade's name, 
all the while screaming powerful obscenities at him. The amount of Shinigami present bothered him slightly, though the hollow never let it show. As much as he were loath to admit, Valakav's words were coming back to haunt him, coating his thoughts with the idea that coming here was suicide. He was not wrong, he wasn't. He would be able to succeed, even if Valakav's words were correct. All of these Shinigami appeared to be either unseated, or at a very low rank within their division. This should be no problem for him, but if this were it, then what was the danger of coming here that Valakav seemed so worried about? They also have the ability to call captains or vice-captains onto the scene on a whim. There was that, too. A sinking feeling plummeted into Naruto's gut, and he realized that if there was an abnormal amount of Shinigami here like Velikav stated, then that was likely true as well. He closed his mind off from the villagers for the time being. He would need all the focus he had in order to complete the trial that lay before him. He heard a whoosh of air from the rooftops over there following by the sight of eleven black-clothed Shinigami land gracefully in a circle around him. They glared at him, gazes of pure hatred hovering in the air and all focused on one thing. Him. The thought alone propelled the bipolar hollow's mood from bad to good. The thrill of combat and the satisfaction you received when killing your enemies was much greater when they despised you. The hollow opened his mouth and chuckled, flaunting the stained red teeth for all the Shinigami around him. He spat a fat wad of blood onto the ground, grinning wider when they seemed to tense up. I wish I could have had more fun with your friend before I killed him, he hissed, trying to prod one of the Shinigami into attacking him. But it was no luck. As although it caused a few of the Shinigami to tremble in rage, it never caused them to overly attack him. Sasaki, did you send out that hell butterfly to Soul Society requesting backup? Asked one of the female Shinigami in a low whisper. Yeah, it should have gotten there by now. Hopefully, they'll send a high-ranked Shinigami here within the next ten minutes, said Sasaki. Then that means we'll just have to hold this bastard off until they get here, right? Asked another one rhetorically. Sasaki chuckled humorlessly. That's exactly what we'll have to do. With that, the eleven Shinigami all jumped onto a smirking Naruto in a tag-team effort, unaware that Naruto was already beginning to charge up a Siro. Ten minutes later. Hirako Shinji didn't know what to think when he stepped out of the Daunai and into Konoha along with two Shinigami escorts. On one hand, he guessed it was good that this supposed the Juchas hadn't done any damage to the civilians of Konoha yet. On the other hand, it clearly wasn't good that the Ajuchas was also snacking on eleven freshly dead Shinigami at that moment. Shinji kept his composure at the sight of the dead bodies, but the two escorts on each side of him weren't so lucky. It took a release of his spiritual pressure to prevent them from lashing out in rage at the currently eating hollow. That wasn't to say that Shinji was a happy camper. In fact, right now Shinji was more grumpy than anything. He was called from his break to go defend Konoha from an Ajuchas. He at least thanked God that he didn't have to go there with his limiter. Granted, he was one of the main supporters of the proposal, but he'd be damned if he didn't chew Minato's ass out for this later. The Ajuchas was ignoring them currently, even though it damn well knew that they were there. Stand back, you two, Shinji said to his escorts. If you two get caught up with someone like him, then you'll die, he whispered seriously, a nonosense look on his face. Why yes, Hirako Fukutechu. They saluted, backing up to near the entrance of the Daunai as the vice-captain confidently walked forward toward the hollow. The hollow was pretending that Shinji wasn't there but the vice-captain wasn't fooled in the least. As soon as he approached the hollow enough, it would lash out with its claws and try to decapitate him. He had seen it several times before. Clang! Yep, this hollow was pretty damn predictable. As soon as he was within five feet of him, the hollow attacked. But Shinji managed to avoid the attack easily be skillfully drawing his Zanpakutu at that exact instant. You're interrupting my meal, Bro, don't they teach you any manners back in soul society? I'm so offended at this that I think I should kill you and defecate all over your corpse, jeered Naruto repulsively, making Shinji grimace at the image. Fifth Division Vice Captain, Hirako Shinji, he introduced, to which Naruto raised an eyebrow. The deadlock was ended between the two when Naruto pulled his claw away from the Zanpakutu and jumped back. What the hell? Do you guys introduce yourselves to everyone you meet? 
Cause I really think I don't give a shit what your name is. Said Naruto. Shinji, instead of looking offended, merely grinned sheepishly at the comment. No. It's just that I was always taught in the Shinigami Academy to introduce myself to a worthy opponent, even if they're a smelly, ragged, retarded-looking fox like you are. Shinji commented. A fire ignited in Naruto's eyes, but other than that he looked completely unfazed at the insulting comment. you are really started to test my patience, Shinigami. I've just about had it with your species bullshit. How you think you're all obligated to protect this law, what with your sending vice-captains and captains on a whim out here? Well guess what, Shinji, or whatever the fuck your name is, it's because of me that this place was discovered by the Hollows in the first place, seeing as I actually was here and killed two Shinigami and a handful of humans. Naruto bragged. Shinji's eyes widened. Wait, that was you? He asked ignoring how this hollow knew about their new law. Naruto just grinned, to which Shinji turned all serious. I see. And if you're coming here a second time, it means that you either have a strong attraction to the type of souls, or have an ulterior motive here. What that ulterior motive is I have no idea, but I do know that you're going to die here, Ajuchas, declared Shinji, his Zanpakutu at the ready and in full preparation for a long fight. Outside of the village, away from all the crazed fighting inside the village, another Garganta appeared. Yet, within the blackness of the void wasn't a horde of hungry hollows, but just one, a small, humanoid one that looked very unassuming. However, if anyone detected this hollow coming into the human world, soul society would have gone bonkers. Valakav Almazin was stepping out of the Garganta, his eyes fixated on the village in front of him. Somewhere, in that village, Naruto was fighting. And that Ryatsu spike that had appeared was definitely of equal strength of Naruto's. A vice captain, most likely, uttered Valakaf to himself as he headed into the village. He just hoped that he could get there in time before Naruto got himself killed. Despite Valakaf's worries, the young hollow was holding himself rather well against the vice captain. His guard and armor didn't allow for any of the Shinigami's sword slashes to wound him and more than once had Naruto been able to deliver some powerful blows to Shinji's face. Shinji prepared for an overhead strike with his sealed Zanpakutu, trying to ignore the injury that was seeping blood down his forehead. But Naruto shot his front paw out at Shinji's hands before he could get the attack off, nearly jarring the sword from his grasp. The vice-captain of the 5th Division stumbled backwards from the blow, trying to keep a stable grip on his Zanpakutu. But Naruto was already on him again using his superior weight to send Shinji to the ground. His raised his black claws in an attempt to finish off Shinji, but the vice-captain wriggled free from the heavy weight and blocked the downward slash with his sword. Shinji used Shunpa to get up into the air, before hovering there in an attempt to create an aerial battle that would work in his favor. Naruto growled. He still couldn't do that levitation thing that high-level Shinigami seemed to be able to use but he wouldn't let a handicap like that take him out of the battle. He ran towards the wall of a nearby house, causing rubble and debris to fall off as he bounced off the wall to get a mid-air standpoint. Shinji narrowed his eyes at the trick, before he braced himself when he saw that the Ajuchas was charging up his orange Ciro. He fired it in mid-air, but the attack had no such effect on the airborne Shinigami as Shinji simply cleaved the energy in half using his Zanpakutu. Naruto hung out in the air for a little while, leaving himself a wide opening for Shinji to exploit. Sure enough, Shinji rocketed off down to the earth, like a meteor of black with an extending, sharp arrow coming off the end. In a split second, Naruto had managed to protect his mask from getting impaled, but he couldn't stop the Shinigami from stabbing his Zanpakuta directly through the left side of his stomach. Naruto roared in pain, but he wasn't down for the count yet. He would use this time to get a surprise attack in on Shinji. La Kava! He roared, and fired the deadly curve of orange energy at Shinji as point-black range. Was Shinji ever surprised to see the Ajuchas launch off an attack like that in an injured state? The corrosive energy connected with his stomach, eating away at his robes and searing his skin until it was charred. The vice-captain was propelled backwards as well, and was unable to press the attack on Naruto any longer. The two of them fell to the ground, their little skirmish in the air done for the time being. Shinji was the first one to get up, 
his injury not being as severe as Naruto's. Panting wildly, he held his sword at an upward angle. Collapse. The sword pointed itself downward. Sakunade, Shinji whispered. The sword seemed to spin upon its own axis as it transformed. Gone was the traditional hilt and guard, and in its place was a strange metal ring, which the whole blade seemed to spin around on. So that's the infamous Shinigami release I've heard so much about. It's my first time seeing one, muttered Naruto as he hoisted himself to his feet. Shinji just smiled roguishly, not commenting on Naruto's muses. Do you smell something good? He asked rhetorically, as a pinkish mist rose into the air. What? Asked the confused Naruto, before he realized that he did in fact smell something good. Don't worry, Hijuchis. It's already taking place. The two escorts of Shinji's were staring in awe at Shinji and his shirt guy, never feeling that he would have the need to release his Zanpakutu in a place like this. So, that's Arako Fukutechu's shirt guy. It's even more impressive than I could possibly imagine, said the first one. But if he feels the need to use his shirt guy here at full power, then the power of that Ajuchas must be great, concurred the second one. The two sat there for a moment with their heads in the clouds, before the first one came onto a realization. Oh yeah. We need to get a picture of the hollow and document it for records in case it ever escapes. He shouted. He turned to his partner. Do you have the new model of soul detection device? He asked. The soul detection device, or as it was known formally as the Denrei Shinki, was the method that Shinigami used to track hollows. However, with the institution of experimental and scientific research disbanding, it was impossible to get any service for detection, but it would at least take pictures. The second escort pulled the bulky thing out of his pocket. By today's standards, it looked like a ridiculous 1980 cell phone, except brown in color. However, it would be hundreds of years before the human world would ever come on to anything like it. Okay, now take the picture before it notices us said the first escort. After you're done with that, call in for more backup. Taking place? What is? Asked Naruto. But Shinji didn't even need to answer that question because the world as Naruto was viewing it was rapidly becoming distorted, until it was a complete flip-flop of what he knew. Welcome to the inverted world. Shinji's catchphrase. Naruto was getting a headache from what was currently going on. Everything was upside down. What's going on? He asked, still in disbelief from the illusion. It should be pretty obvious by now, Ajuchas. Everything's inverted, said Shinji, before he sprung into action. I don't know what's going on, but right now I just have to fight you, don't I? Said Naruto as Shinji rushed at him. He tried to block Shinji's sword slash, but instead of hitting anything, he found himself getting cut on the back, the exact opposite place where Shinji had been attacking from. Naruto attempted to clutch his back wound, but just ended up touching his torso instead. Damn it, what's going on? Everything's inverted. Everything. That includes the position of your perceived wound, said Shinji's voice from someplace Naruto couldn't see. Naruto turned around immediately, trying to locate the voice of his opponent. But as soon as he turned around, the hollow was slashed again by a Shinji who just seemed to appear from nowhere. But, as he was getting slashed, Naruto noticed something very peculiar about this world. It seemed like for a split second during Shinji's attack, his view of the inverted world reverted back to normal. Maybe, the mist wasn't potent enough to override pain yet. But Naruto didn't see how he'd be able to make use of being slashed all the time. He wasn't some spiky-haired, eye-patched tank who could shrug off hundreds of injuries and still be able to enjoy battle. He caught a glimpse of Shinji again and carelessly launched another cove at him. But like previous attacks, it turned out to be useless as the world was inverted. Naruto racked his brain, trying to think of something in his arsenal that he could use. There was this new attack that he had been practicing in Hueco Mundo for a while. He wondered if something like that would work in a world like this. But first, he would need to wait for the right time, while continuously fending off attacks. He saw Shinji charging at him yet again but this time Naruto turned directly around and attempted to slash at the vice-captain. He still missed his mark by quite a bit, but it was enough to make Shinji avoid taking a risk at slashing him. Another slash. 
He wasn't in position yet. A lucky blocked attack. Naruto was beginning to charge energy to one of his tails. A direct frontal slash at him from directly ahead of him. Now. Circulo cola. Naruto exclaimed, as he shot the orange bit of light off from his tail. At first, the beam looked just like an ordinary Ciro with its trajectory. But pretty soon, Naruto's tails resonated with the energy to make a wide left. Pretty soon, the orange light had completely circled around the area, before being absorbed into Naruto's tails. Shinji, who in reality was attacking from behind, was caught off guard by the strange attack, and was hit by the orange beam just as it was about to go back to Naruto's tails. The vice captain screamed in pain as he was propelled forward by the blast. He smacked into the wall of a building, barely conscious with his skin charred. With the weakness of its owner, Shinji's shirk eye faded and the pink mist dispersed, revealing a normal world for Naruto and a defeated Shinji. H. Hirako Fukutechu said the two escorts simultaneously, and the second one dropped his communicator in shock. There lay the vice captain, leaning against the wall, defeated by that ajuchas. There was just no way something like that could happen, it was ludicrous, but it was true. Their vice captain had been defeated by an ajuchas. The two Shinigami were beginning to panic. Over the well-being of Shinji, over the well-being of themselves, and over the well-being of the village. Hirako Fukutechu cried out the second escort, before the first one clapped his hand over his mouth. The second one appeared to try some muffled speech, but the first one shushed him immediately. Naruto swiveled his head to look at them, a dazed yet angry look fixated upon the Shinigami. He's looking at us whispered the first escort frantically. When did you call for backup? He asked his comrade. A about seven minutes ago. I requested a captain this time because it looked like a vice captain would have trouble. The second escort could not hide his concern. With a faraway scream, and against the wishes of his comrade, he ran as fast as his legs could carry him over to where Shinji was lying barely conscious. I idiot. Did not come over here. H.E.O.K. kill you, wheezed Shinji from his position against the wall. Sure enough, Naruto bared his teeth menacingly as the escort ran over to aid his vice-captain. Quick as a flash, Naruto swung his claws horizontally at the unfocused Shinigami, severing head from body in an instant. Even though it was a remarkably clean kill on Naruto's part, the Shinigami's comrades yelled as they witnessed him be decapitated. Naruto picked up the severed head with his claws, and hugged it to his body warmly. Ooh, I love my severed head. Oh, yes I do, he said in a faux, high-pitched, sing-song voice. Was he ever happy to be able to act goofy again, especially since he hadn't gotten the chance in his last fight? But, as he hugged the severed head, Naruto also applied too much force to it, and as a result the head was crushed underneath the weight, and blood and brains were sprayed all over Naruto's body. Oops. Looks like I squeezed too hard. The first escort glared at him hatefully. How dare that hollow treat his buddy's severed head like that? He was just about to let the anger get the best of him, and engage the hollow in combat, when a large figure flew straight over his head. Luckily for him, the creature didn't take his head off at all, but both he and Shinji were shocked when he clumsily scooped up the ajuchas over his head and made off with it. W wait. See come back H here W with Shinji was cut off as he began wheezing again. Hirako Fukutechu, exclaimed the living escort, forgetting the ajuchas and rushing over to his vice-captain's aid. What was that? That figure. It was completely human-sized, but I sensed a powerful riatsu from it, and its riatsu was also more like a hollow than anything. Shinji thought, pondering over the existence of the strange creature. His eyes moved all over the place while he thinking, and finally widened when he came to a realization. Let go of me, you moron! Let go! roared Naruto, as he noticed that Valakav was the one who had grabbed his out of nowhere and pulled him away from the village. The old hollow said nothing to him, and did nothing more than tighten his grip on Naruto as he opened a garganta in midair. I had him! Didn't you see that? I beat the vice captain you were so afraid of and I could have gone on and destroyed the village from that point on. How long do you plan on getting in my way, Valakav? Valakav sighed at his idiotic remark. You still don't get it, Naruto? 
Naruto glared at him, and then turned away to avoid having to speak to Valakav. It would have been a captain next, Naruto. Didn't you see that the vice captain had two escorts and a daumai open? One of them most likely called for more backup, and this time it would have been a captain. Shut up. I don't care about that. I could have taken a captain if I wanted to, he whispered to himself. Fool. You couldn't have killed a captain, no matter how much you struggled. And I don't think you understand your position. I saved you out of the goodness of my so-called heart. But next time you go and pull something like this I won't come to your rescue. No one asked you to come save me. Naruto muttered. Next time I won't. Fine. Fine. As the two hollows bantered, Valakav slipped into the black portal for hollows and was safe from the Shinigami. I'm fine, I tell you. Shinji snapped at his escort. Clearly, Shinji was not fine, as when he stood to walk, blood began pouring in even greater quantities than when he was sitting down. Hiroko Fukutechu, shouted the escort in concern. Ignore my injuries for right now. The most important thing that happened here is that we let a very dangerous hollow escape from us. If we leave that one alone, he'll definitely kill more Shinigami. And the Godii 13 is already strapped for forces right now. He limped on over to where the Daunai was, and noticed the mobile communicator device laying on the ground next to the Daunai. I'll go back and report this development to the captain, and receive medical treatment for myself later. I hope you at least gathered some intel of that hollow before it escaped he said. The emergency situation right now was apparently kicking in some unused adrenaline. Why, yes, sir. The escort saluted. Shinji nodded. Good, that will become useful in future situations. Now I want you to listen carefully to my orders right now. As soon as we get back to Soul Society, I want you to immediately go to the Ninth Division and give them that information so they can put in their files. This is a hollow that needs to be dealt with carefully, and the first step in the right direction is to add its information and threat level to our database. Another salute. Good, now let's go. Shinji ordered as he and the escort stepped into the Dangai. Later that day, the escort turned in his report to the 9th Division, who scanned the hollow's picture and produced a slightly blown up 8x10 replica of the snapshot. The representative Shinigami placed the picture along with the information in one of their files. Quadrupedal fox ajuches. Seven feet long by two feet wide. Grievances. Twelve humans killed, sixteen Shinigami killed, has attacked the village of Kanahigakur no Sato on more than one occasion. And lastly, is the primary reason behind the hollow's discovery of the continent of the elemental countries. He read off through Naruto's information. Threat level, critical. From now on, this hollow shall go by the codename of Vulpus C, said the Shinigami as he finished compiling the information. When he finished, he turned the escort with a worried look. This hollow is clearly very dangerous, and at such a high threat level for a first-time appearance, we need to be on our toes with this new rising star. Which is why the Ninth Division has decided to do the following course of action. With that, the Shinigami walked over to where the Shinigami version of file cabinets were and placed that hollow's information in the confines of a particular hollow, one that was labeled Most Wanted Hollows. Chapter 16, Una Nueva Formation Naruto was shoved none too gently onto the white sand by the former Vasta Lord King, yet this did nothing to alleviate the tension occurring between the two. There was a quiet mechanical noise, and the garganta behind Valakav was closed within a few seconds. The former king didn't move, opting to sternly stare condescendingly down upon the younger hollow, who was currently glaring back up hatefully. He had warped them back to the bottom of the canyon, directly outside his tower. Valakav could tell that this was the last place that Naruto wanted to be. The young hollow finally rised himself to his feet, going up to Valakav and digging his rough claws into the Vasta Lord's shoulders. Said hollow didn't even flinch at the sharp claws that entered his skin. You son of a bitch! Naruto roared, his words barely recognizable with all the hate and anger that existed within his tone. The first sentence he said was full of conviction, but his voice began to waver a little as he spoke afterwards. I had them. The village. I could have destroyed them if you hadn't shown up. It's all your fucking fault, asshole. 
You and your retarded fear of the Shinigami prevented me from completing my dream right there. You. It was then that Valakav made the first move since coming to Hueco Mundo. He raised his fist slowly, before bringing it down firmly upon Naruto's mask. The younger hollow crumbled from the surprising amount of force that had been behind the punch, and he flew back several feet before lying on the ground prone. Idiot, he stated stoically. Weren't you listening to anything I was saying before this? There was no way you could have ever beaten a captain at your current level of skill. A captain's power is far more than you could ever imagine. It's a level far beyond that of anything a vice captain could perform. I just saved your life back there, Naruto, so I would appreciate it if you showed me a little gratitude. Valakav's voice raised slightly as he finished his speech. Oh, please. Who would ever show gratitude to someone like you? Naruto said angrily, rubbing his paw across his mask while pulling himself to his feet. Valakav let a little disdain come onto his face. He turned away from Naruto and began to walk, but it was not so he could go back into his tower. In fact, the former king was walking away from his place of residence. He came to a pause about thirty feet away, leaning slightly on a particular good-sized quartz tree. Do you want power? he asked rhetorically. Naruto was suddenly thrown for a loop by the odd behavior. Wasn't it clear to Valakav that he always wanted power? Do you want revenge? Valakav asked. Naruto was beginning to get annoyed with these types of questions. Yeah. I want both of those things. He said cautiously. Valakav didn't turn to face him, but he nodded anyway. If you want either of those things, then you have to be patient and learn to strike your enemies at the right time. Don't be like me, who was so overconfident in his abilities that it cost him everything that I ever wanted in Hueco Mundo. Naruto calmed down at Valakav's words, but took a little moment to ponder this. If what you say is true, I would need a tremendous amount of power to be able to destroy the village. Yet I don't have the time to just slowly gain enough power. Even if I did gain that much power, by the time I did, everyone I would want to get revenge would be dead, he said weakly, his head pivoted towards the ground. Do you really believe that would be detrimental to your dream? asked Valakav. Naruto turned up at that question, greatly confused at what the Vasto Lord was implying. Was it that there still was a chance for it even after everyone in the current generation of Konoha was dead? A small swelling of hope arose in his heart. He just needed to figure out what Valakav was talking about before he came to a reasonable conclusion. What are you talking about? Is there any way to... He cut off slowly, before the Ajucha's eyes widened in realization. He was a fucking idiot. Why didn't he realize that before? Valakav nodded. It seems that you've figured out where I'm going with this. Naruto nodded. Yes, even if you wait 100 years to attack Konoha, after everyone there currently has died, there would be no difference. That's because when they died, they would move on to Soul Society, which you plan on destroying anyway. In essence, no matter when and where you do it, you'd still be getting your revenge. I implore you, Naruto, to take your time and deal with this very precarious situation. There's no telling when the guard around Konoha will be dropped, if ever. You have already witnessed the result of going there alone will do, so the only way for you to attack that place is to raise an army and finish off the village in a clean sweep. There was a glimmer of something in Valakav's eyes when he said, though Naruto couldn't quite place what it was. It almost immediately disappeared. But Naruto couldn't forget the strange emotion that made itself present in Valakav's eyes. Was it regret? Sadness, maybe? Naruto, stop spacing out for a moment and listen to what I'm going to tell you here. I know that you also have the desire to become a powerful king in Hueco Mundo and overthrow Barrigan's lost no chase. But before you do that, there is one requirement you absolutely must fulfill. Naruto's interest was piqued. He had always considered the kingdom goal to be secondary to his Konoha goal, but it looks like now they might become intermingled with each other. One would lead to the other, so to speak. And what is that? Valakav stared at him, his yellow eyes now filled with uncertainty. You must become a Vasto Lord. Naruto's eyes widened behind his mask, and he made an audible gaping noise. Vasto Lord were particularly rare in Hueco Mundo 
and a hollow becoming one would definitely go down in Hueco Mundo legend. W what? Do you have any idea how difficult it is to become a Vasto Lord? If something like that is one of the requirements, then I'm just better off not forming my own kingdom and attacking Kanoha on my own. Valakav made a slight humming noise. And here I thought you were a confident young hollow. What happened to your resolve? It is definitely true that becoming a Vasto Lord is no easy task, but if you're going to place your dreams ahead of everything else then this is something you're going to have to do. But, I know that you can do this, Naruto. I would have thought escaping from Lost No Chase was impossible, but you pulled it off. Just think of it as one of the many obstacles you'll have to overcome. The two hollow were silent for a moment, the quiet allowing Valakav's words to sink into Naruto. Once you have become a Vasto Lord, you must travel far, far to the east. Far enough to reach the ocean. Yes, Naruto, there is an ocean in Hueco Mundo. It's not all desert. I swear, too many hollows have such a limited knowledge of their own home world. Velikav ranted. Anyway, once you reach the ocean, you'll find an enormous plateau with a series of caves near the bottom. That is the spot. It's the only territorially safe area in this area of Hueco Mundo, and it's virtually unknown to the other rulers. Naruto was thoroughly amazed at the fact there was something like an ocean in Hueco Mundo. Everywhere he looked it was nothing but craggy desert. I didn't realize Hueco Mundo had an ocean. Just how big is Hueco Mundo? He asked, getting off topic. Velikav grunted at the question, but decided to answer it anyway. I'm not sure. All I know is that it's much, much bigger than the Shinigami and even most hollows give it credit for. Easily bigger than both the human world and soul society combined. I spent my first twenty years doing nothing more than traveling this place. But I doubt I have even seen five percent of what Hueco Mundo truly has to offer. Naruto had his breath taken away by the account. There was so much to see in this place, but he knew he would never be able to fully experience it. It was something that created an aura of insignificance for him, which no matter how powerful one become would never be taken away. It must be a lie. A lie? Lies were such ugly things, but they were so beneficial at the same time. Even the devil could imitate a saint if he just lied. That was the ugly part. But a parent could also keep their child away from horrors of the world through a lie. That was such a beautiful thing. People have such minds that they tend to condemn liars, no matter how beneficial it may be to the recipient. The twisted embrace of a lie was the worst feeling in the world for some people, and they would take it out on those who had lied. Maybe that was exactly what this hollow in front of him was doing. Lying to him. Naruto didn't see any particular reason why Valakav should be helping him. Was his name really Valakav in the first place? He had grown soft and trusting since his spat with Firmos when he should have become the opposite. How long would it be before this liar betrayed him? Why, are you helping me? Naruto asked. Valakav, despite all his emotional turmoil, didn't react. He stood there like a lone tower, as stoic as it was powerful. He didn't even respond to the question asked. And then, the lone tower moved away from Naruto. Turning his back away from Naruto, he walked thirty feet before pausing, the tension in the air reaching even him. And then, he spoke. These last three years have been difficult for me. My kingdom has fallen, my comrades have disappeared, and my tower has gone into decay. I would like to think of going back to those happy days where my kingdom was at its height, but now I feel that would do nothing for me. Naruto should have been surprised by the sudden monologue, but if he was he didn't show it. And then you showed up. You challenged Barrigan's lost no chase, and came out alive. You've attacked Kanoha, and proven yourself different from all the yokels that usually pass through this place. And you are similar to me. In life, you wanted nothing more than to help the shinobi world, but in the afterlife you have nothing but pure hatred and disgust for it. You have big dreams, Naruto. Ones that someone like me could never accomplish. Valakav paused in his speech whether he was debating to add something to it. And I would be worse than scum if I didn't help my direct descendant out. Valakav smiled, hearing Naruto try and splutter out a response. D-descendant? And me? That would M-make us, 
he started. Velikov nodded. Family, he stated simply. Velikov started walking away again, coming to a stop much farther away. He looked up the perpetual Hueco Mundo Moon, feeling a strange sense of calmness wash all over him. In that way, he was the same as Naruto. But family we may be, there is nothing more I can do for you. I've been watching you develop since you were twelve years old, but I grow weary of the public scene. I bet it's time for me to settle down and spend the remainder of my life wandering Hueco Mundo and lamenting what I could have done differently. He started walking again. Goodbye, Naruto. We will never see each other again. My time in the limelight is long over, and yours is just beginning. Do the hollow species a favor and fulfill your dreams. Those Shinigami won't be able to stand in your way anymore. With those final words, Valakav began to walk away into the horizon, never looking back at Naruto. Naruto stood there dumbly for a few seconds, but he realized he had forgotten something. W. Wait, Valakav. Can you at least tell me what your name was in life? He called after the retreating Vasto Lord. Valakav didn't stop walking, but he did in fact respond to that question. I have long forgotten my human name, Naruto. He called back. But I do remember the title I went by when I was in the shinobi world. You should know what I mean when I say the word Rikudu. He called back. Naruto's jaw dropped open. This old hollow was the legendary sage. He was related to the creator of ninjutsu? A small swell hit the desert at that exact moment, and a large cloud of sand arose between Naruto and Valakav. Naruto had to close his eyes to avoid the pain, and when he opened them again the cloud had cleared and the old hollow was gone. Five years later. There's another one, Naruto said sadistically, as he tore into the flesh of a bird like a juchus, while the bird's companions looked on in horror. Mmm, -hmm. this one's really good, he said with a mouth full of bird. The other juchus seemed to take offense at that, pouncing on the much smaller juchus in an attempt of revenge. You guys want him too? Naruto asked and scooped up a little bit of the bird's flesh with his claws. Quick as a flash, he was on one of the other hollows, stuffing the bloody muscle and sinew down its throat. Okay. Have some of this bird. It's good stuff. He cried happily, as the hollow gagged on the flesh of its dead friend. Using its disgust as a distraction, Naruto thrust his powerful claws into the ajucha's head, penetrating its brain and killing it instantly. The final Ajuchas was completely unfazed by its comrade's death, but the Ciro that Naruto had fired off instantly atomized the attacking Ajuchas. The hollow collapsed onto its back, breathing in happiness at the three hollows it had killed. Naruto had been doing this for five years now, and even though he felt his power increasing with every meal, he knew it wasn't enough to become Vasta Lord. Naruto didn't let that bother him. This process was turning out a lot simpler than he had imagined and he had proven himself to be fully capable of surviving against other ajuchas. Maybe he did have what it takes to become a Vasto Lord. The one he had eaten today was his 700th and 54th ajuchas, a pretty low number for someone who had been doing it for half a decade. Maybe living as an absolute untamed hollow had changed him a little. He supposed something like that would cause changes no matter what. The sand sure is comfortable today. It puts me in the mood for thinking back on old memories, he thought wistfully, and an image of Furmos popped into his mind. I'm on my way towards completing your dream too, you fucking dusha bag. But of course, you wouldn't know because I didn't tell you I would be doing that in the first place. Valakav wants me to better the hollow species as well, so it seems that your dream is going to be a direct result of mine, isn't it Furmos? He said to the sky giggling a little when he thought of the nasty deed he performed when killing Furmos. He knew in his heart that Furmos was a great hollow, and that he had stood out as a shining bastion in the middle of this wasteland. For better or for worse, the firefly had managed to inspire in him something that Naruto had thought extinct. And Naruto hated him for that. The hollow hated how Furmos had managed to instill in him the very thing he was trying to stamp out of himself. Oh, he bet that his Shinigami self was laughing at him from beyond the grave. He just couldn't decline Furumo's dream that day, even if he put on a facade that made it seem that way. It made him feel inferior, knowing that despite all his efforts, 
he still hadn't managed to become free of those worthless feelings of compassion. Maybe he needed to pick up the pace on this sort of thing. Naruto pulled himself to his feet in an attempt to stave off these kinds of thoughts, and looked to his north. Some distance away there was a rough, craggy rock formation with a series of holes in each rock. The fox hollow frowned. There was likely nothing there but a colony of weak hollows easy pickings for him, but they wouldn't do anything in increasing in power. Not to mention, they weren't very tasty or filling at all. It wouldn't be worth the trip there, and would just create unnecessary exhaustion for him. A bad thing when you could be attacked at any time. Naruto learned quickly to use high places to recuperate from wounds, as that greatly reduced the chance of being attacked. Unfortunately, Naruto almost always sustained wounds in battles, and as a result he was forced to take shelter in those places. It didn't help that he couldn't go out and hunt for fear of being killed when weak. A small lizard hollow burrowed its way from underground, fixing its little eyes upon Naruto. Naruto stared back uninterested, even when the lizard crawled up a nearby quartz tree, never letting its eyes wander away from him. Naruto sighed. I just fought, and already I'm longing for the thrill of combat. Ever since I began hunting, I've felt the need for battle much stronger. It becomes unbearable to even be away from fighting for longer than a few days. But I don't suppose you would understand, he said to the little hollow, who didn't respond. The lizard hollow burrowed back underground, and Naruto watched it with an unreadable expression on his face. He couldn't shake this uneasy feeling that had just washed all over him. As he walked in a certain direction, the feeling became more pronounced. He walked for about a mile westward, to where he came across some abnormally large sand dunes. Each one could easily house a colony of hollows. Indeed, he did sense some weak riazza within the dunes, but there was one in particular that set his nerves on end. It danced around in the air, and filled his body with powerful pressure he hadn't felt in a long time. It had the coldness of steel, yet the ferocity and power of a lion. The riazza came from all directions, making it impossible to locate. A bead of salty sweat rolled down inside Naruto's mask, his breath hitched in his throat, and his hair stood on end. Whatever was making this riazza was no slouch, that much was for sure. So, the ominous feeling I've had for a while was correct, after all. There's someone here, and by the looks of it, it's a powerful hollow, Naruto whispered to himself. Up upon the top of the enormous sand dune, a lone figure stood, shadowed by the moon. The silhouette's head was tilted downwards, watching Naruto's every move. A firework went off in the village of Kanoha, filling the night sky with beautiful shades of red and green. Another one went off shortly afterwards, this time sprayed much different colors than its predecessor. The denizens of the village below clapped and cheered at the display. Children rode on their parents' shoulders, eyes strained to take in every sight of the celebration. Drunken adults laughed heartily with each other, as they recalled a certain embarrassing incident, or what not. Even the ninja joined in the festivities, using the time to catch up with friends or relatives when they've had such precious little time to over the past five years. They just couldn't believe that their trial was finally over. Even annoying children couldn't sully the mood they were in. For today was the day they were finally victorious. A wabakure had finally surrendered to them, the long, unexpected war taking a serious toll on their military. Though when it came down to it, they were never a match for the superior Konoha Shinobi and their Kyubi Chakra. But a simple loss wasn't all that occurred today. Danza would accept nothing less than an unconditional surrender, and as a result, Iwagakure and all of Tsuchi no Kuni was annexed by Kanoha, which was current cause of the celebration. Their will of fire would spread farther than they could ever imagine, and Kanoha's prosperity would begin anew. The terrible conditions from eight years ago seemed like nothing more than a dream. Their empire was now fully on the path to greatness, but this war was not without its losses. While tonight was a day of celebration, tomorrow would be a day of mourning to all the brave Kanoha shinobi who had lost their lives fighting for their village. Among the losses were 21-year-old Jounin Hida Hinata, who was killed two years into the war in an ambush. There was also 24-year-old Jounin and medical captain Hirano Sakura, who died barely a month before the war officially ended. Hirono-sama's death hit the village hard, as they had never seen a finer fighter and healer in all their time. 
even the great Sonate, who had passed away three years ago due to cancer couldn't compare to her. But their sacrifices were not in vain, as their village and country would now become the pinnacle of civilization in the elemental countries. Kubi chakra implants were becoming more and more successful with the advancement of their experimentation, and village's standard of living was skyrocketing ever higher. The sixteenth generation of Kanoha was leading it soundly. They had far surpassed the fifteenth generation in abilities, and generations to come after them would continue to grow in power like the tradition of Kanoha says. Danza's successor had been named, and there were high hopes that he would lead the village down a path of prosperity once their current leader died. The day of mourning passed by eventfully, and the citizens of Kanoha were able to go to bed peacefully that night, their thoughts on the heroes of Kanoha and how they had died for their sake. Less than two weeks later, the Rokadame Hokage Danza passed away in his sleep. He was eighty years old. Chapter 17 Subordinato Naruto didn't know what to think when he noticed that lone figure standing under the potent gaze of the moonlight. It was obvious that it was the one who was radiating the powerful Ryatsu, but Naruto strangely didn't feel anything towards it. It wasn't so weak that he would be able to finish a fight quickly, nor so strong that he wouldn't be able to move without suffocating. If anything, it was around the level of his Ryatsu, and that usually indicated a tough fight. The silhouette's gaze was clearly upon him, but Naruto had a hard time locking eyes with the other hollow. He noticed it stood on two legs, was about seven feet tall, and had a helmet mask that had two long points sticking upwards out of each side, almost like horns. But those weren't the most prominent features. Out of the hollow's back he could clearly see large, velvety wings that sprouted upwards. It gave the creature a demonic visage, even though Naruto couldn't clearly see the entire body. Naruto would have thought it was a vast allure due to his upright position, if the Ryatsu signature didn't tell him otherwise. Naruto took his eyes off the figure for merely a split second, but in that time the silhouette had disappeared, and all that Naruto viewed was the Hueco Mundo Crescent Moon that the hollow was once standing in front of. Naruto's superior hearing picked up a whoosh of cold air over to the right, and the Ajuchas strained his neck to order to not be caught off guard any longer. He spotted the figure standing next to a rock a distance away, its back turned to him. Clearly, it believed him to be easy prey. Naruto grinned wildly. It wouldn't do for him to be underestimated. Dropping the mask on his Ryatsu, he let the orange energy flow fully from his body, unveiling a thin orange layer of the stuff that went fully around his body. The figure stirred a little bit, and Naruto grinned even wider when he noted that he had the hollow's attention. It was a good reason the other hollow was paying attention, as Naruto's full Ryatsu seemed to be slightly greater than its own. The hollow finally turned around to face him, and even though its face was covered by a mask, Naruto could see that its green eyes held nothing but contempt for him. It released a little more Ryatsu, so that it became even with Naruto's. The orange and green energy lit up the night sky, each battling for dominance over the other. And while Naruto's orange Ryatsu was wild and emotional, the other hollow's green was cold and robotic. Naruto was finally able to see more of the hollow's pronounced features. In addition to the wings and horns, it was covered in a black fur that went around most of its body, significantly thinning as it went down the creature's legs. It had clawed feet, looking much like bird talons, yet they were much bulkier. There was a thin, whip-like tail that protruded from the hollow's backside, and a flat, bat-like mass that exposed its poisonous, green eyes. Naruto hissed in pleasure, running his tongue across his hideous, yellow teeth. The other hollow looked greatly disgusted by such an act, and its expression told that. Naruto kicked up the sand, feeling restless and wantonly shaking with delight. And then, it happened. Naruto sprung into action immediately after he did that, his red body darting all over the sand in a zigzag pattern. His obnoxious laughter followed the hollow wherever he zoomed, and it intensified when he was about to close in on the other ajuchas. Much to his surprise, the other hollow was ready for him. It stoically observed his movements, and after seeing that they were at a manageable speed, broke his guard fluidly with a sharp jab directly below his hollow hole. Naruto's tough skin was the only thing that prevented him from being impaled, but the attack still stirred up quite a bit of blood. The Ajuchas backed off after the successful counterattack by his opponent, coughing up some blood onto the ground as he did. 
Trash. With a head-on strategy like that, it doesn't matter how strong your Ryatsu is. The Hollow spoke for the first time, and his voice was just as contemptuous as his gaze. Naruto sneered at the comment. You probably believe in yourself so confidently because you're an Ajuchis, and can go through that type of battle strategy. However, all of the other Ajuchis in Hueco Mundo have gone through just as many trials as you, and can thoroughly anticipate and react to such behavior. He droned on. He ignored the fact that Naruto was rudely mocking his mouth movements. Blah blah blah. You really talk a lot for someone who comes off as stoic. You think I give a shit about what you think about my battle strategies? You're an even bigger bitch than you let on. Naruto retorted. The hollow merely looked at him in distaste. Oh, don't throw a massive bitch hit. You'll ruin the fun of this fight. Naruto roared. Don't you at least want to die having some fun, bat boy? He asked, his loud voice creating a splitting headache for the other hollow. Oh, please. There is no enjoyment to be held in battle. Or anything for that matter. All that exists is emptiness, in battle and in life. There is no meaning or purpose to anything, and our lives as hollows are living proof of that. He said emotionlessly, raising his black claw in preparation to fight. You're quite the little emo, aren't you? Maybe I should beat into your head the meaning of battle, and the exhilaration that comes with it. Naruto said, his smile dampened somewhat from his opponent's depressing words. The bad hollow looked a little insulted by the previous comment, and drew the fox hollow's attention by doing a quick little hand motion that made it seem like he was going to attack with them. But that wasn't the case, as while Naruto was watching the hypnotic movement of his hands, he shot his hidden tail out like a whip. The thin tail almost caught Naruto by the face, but the keyword here was almost. Naruto's superb hearing caught the whistling of the appendage as it zipped towards him, and at the last second he broke his trance and sidestepped to avoid the attack. Naruto hissed in joy, and reached out to grab the tail before the other hollow could retract it. He was far too slow, as the bat hollow didn't retract the tail, but instead used it to attack. In the very short frame of time, he wrapped his tail around Naruto's front leg, causing the fox hollow to trip up when he attempted to move around. While on the ground, the Ajucha swung his tail with a surprising amount of strength, flinging Naruto over to the right towards a large boulder. Naruto smashed into the rock, but minimized the damage by springing his free legs against it. However, it didn't completely eliminate any damage, and there still was a small crater in the rock surface where Naruto had smashed into it. He felt a trail of blood run down from his forehead underneath the mask, and tasted the coppery substance enter his mouth. The bat hollow was standing around fifty feet away, looking smug from his recent successful attack. Naruto moved a piece of rock that was currently holding him down, and grunted in pain. His thick skin would protect him from being defeated like that, but he'd be damned if that didn't hurt at least a little. Lakava, he whispered to himself, after he sure was sure that the building Ryatsa on the end of one of his tails was hidden from view. He released the familiar attack but his opponent backhanded it away as if it were nothing. Naruto growled, did he just hit a tempered mass of Ryatsu with his bear claw? His skin must be just as tough as mine. It was infuriating to see his attack battered away so easily, and was to learn that Lakava was useless for the entire remainder of the fight. But Naruto didn't have time to dwell on this, as the bat hollow was preparing to attack again. Naruto sped away from the green Siro that would have engulfed him and appeared at a position directly towards his opponent's right. He thrust his cruel claws outward in a stabbing motion, but the bat skillfully crouched below and grasped Naruto's arm. The hollow then placed his black, clawed fingers centimeters away from Naruto's face, and charged up another Ciro. The fox hollow avoided that swiftly, and for a few seconds fox and bat were trapped in a bastardized version of tug-of-war. The bat hollow finally gained the upper hand, and delivered a powerful kick to Naruto's face that broke the hold. The finesse of the kick allowed it to land in a vital spot, and Naruto almost felt his mask crack underneath the pressure. Naruto kept his balance, however, as he slid backwards through the sand. He thrust his arm out, and invariably shot off one of his orange ciros. The bat hollow was surprised by the sudden attack, and a cloud of dust and smoke arose as it made contact. Naruto stopped sliding, and fell to one of his knees. Panting heavily, 
he looked at his slightly singed paws with annoyance. He put a little bit too much juice in that one, but it looked like he heavily injured his opponent. A small rustling noise brought Naruto out of his reverie. The dust was clearing fast, and Naruto could tell that the bat was far from being defeated. In fact, if he weren't so stoic, Naruto didn't doubt that the hollow would be very angry right about now. The silhouette of the bat hollow was now fully on its feet, and it didn't take the time for the dust to clear completely, as it rocketed out in the open, using its wings for the first time. This display caught Naruto off guard, and he was forced to avoid a powerful jab that would have no doubt killed him. He rolled across the sand clumsily, dragging himself to his feet to match the airborne hollow. Naruto blocked two punches and a kick, while parrying yet another jab to the cheek. This time, his claws connected with the bat's right shoulder, yet the three shallow gashes caused only minimal wounds. You trash, said the hollow with contempt, not even flinching from the wound. He delivered a few light claw scratches that Naruto avoided, but then whipped Naruto across the back with his tail. The bat hollow closed his eyes as Naruto went skidding again, and placed his hand over his wound. He left it there for a few seconds, and when he released it the wound had already completely healed. What? How did you do that? asked Naruto in awe. The bat hollow blinked at the question, surely he couldn't be serious? High-speed regeneration. It's something I've developed recently with my evolution into an ajuchas, yet it's a hallmark ability throughout Hueco Mundo. Tell me, how long have you been a hollow? He asked, keen on learning the reason behind Naruto's obliviousness. Naruto was thrown off guard by the odd question. Oh, eight or nine years, I guess, said Naruto wistfully. The bat hollow would have facebombed if that wasn't out of his character. You're telling me, you've been a hollow for the same amount of time I have, and you haven't developed or even heard of high-speed regeneration. You really need to work on your information-gathering, trash he said. Hey, three of those years I was stuck in a lost no-chase jail cell rotting to death. I didn't exactly have time to gather information, said Naruto hotly, perturbed by the other hollow's insults. He used Sonido to appear right next to his opponent, and with his anger intensifying his riatsu, delivered a nasty gash to the bad hollow's face. A little piece of mass broke off, but the wound was quickly sealing up. Naruto, however, would give his opponent no time to recover. He jabbed his back paw into the bat's torso and slashed again at its face. The other hollow was grunting in effort and eventually found the skirmish to be not working in his favor. He broke off from the rabid hollow, coming to a standstill a safe distance away from Naruto. His anger exhausted from the attack, Naruto turned around and laughed, making his opponent wonder if he had truly lost his sanity. Nevertheless, the short break the hollow had taken allowed him to heal from his wounds. Naruto did an obnoxious little twirl before he was ready to resume attacking. Clearly, the upper hand he was gaining in the battle was causing him to return to his normal, giddy self. But his opponent still had a few tricks up his sleeve. And with Naruto's current state of mind, he would be likely to fall for them. The fox was pressuring the bat with powerful, yet reckless blows laughing insanely while he did so. The bat hollow was grunting and panting as he moved backwards, desperately seeking any opportunity to get an attack in. Who's the one who said frontal attacks don't work? Huh? Naruto yelled, his psychotic voice causing a stir within the bat's mind. The other hollow glared back severely at Naruto, trying to whip out his tail to attack Naruto. The fox hollow kicked the thin tail while it was in the air, causing it to fall limp to the ground. The hollow was slightly disoriented from his thwarted attack, and Naruto used this to his advantage. Pausing, he put his wrists together so his paws were opposite to each other, then thrust them forward and slashed horizontally along his opponent's torso. Like a hideous flower, gash marks bloomed outwards along the hollow's torso, leaving six complementary gashes when the deed was done. Unlike last time, these wounds were as deep as can be, and showed when the bat hollow fell backwards, coughing up blood. Naruto was on him again, attempted to stab straight through the hollow's head with one of his ankle spikes. The bat hollow managed to roll out of the way of the attack, causing Naruto to stab nothing more than sand. The bat fired another green Siro, which Naruto ducked out of way. Siro. Siro. I like Siro's, but is that all you know how to do? 
he asked. Naruto waved his paws outwards. Try something new. I can't get off if you don't add in a little variety. The bat hollow ignored him and fired another two zeros from his claws, which Naruto fairly easily avoided. He continued firing zeros for another few seconds, trying to hit Naruto as he rushed towards him while avoiding the zeros. Clang! Claw met claw as the bat hollow parry Naruto's claws with his own. Naruto attempted the same attack a second time, only the result was the same. Now Fox and Bat were locked in a deadly standstill, two of their claws locked with each other. The Bat was the one to break it off this time, hopping in the air and performing a spinning kick that its lithe size allowed it to perform. Naruto caught the foot with his right front paw and threw the Bat off him with a sturdy push. The other Ajuchas wasn't that phased though, as he recovered himself while flying in midair. Taking time to adopt a new strategy, the bat took off up into the air, stopping to hover around fifty feet above Naruto. Naruto looked livid at this display. H. Hey. Get your bitch ass down here, fucker. Don't tell me you're just gonna camp out up there all day. Yelled Naruto childishly. The bat said nothing, and all Naruto could hear was the flapping of its wings. Fuck you then. No one screws with me like this, whispered Naruto his voice deathly silent yet holding an intense pitch of hatred behind its tone. He hung his head down, stumbling in his stance. I'll show you. I'll show all of you motherfuckers. Here's what I say to that. He roared, and released an incredibly powerful zero from his mouth. The orange beam spread over an area twice the size of his normal one, and it had intense anger flowing in it. The bat hollow swooped in and die bombed caught off guard by Naruto's hair-trigger temper. For an agonizing minute, he flew around in a circle, dodging Siro after Siro as they lit up the sky in a furious orange light show. Fly away, little moth! Fly! Naruto roared, launching yet another Siro. The bat avoided that one by flying around a quartz tree that the Siro obliterated. The bat hollow grunted as the energy still managed to singe him slightly and cast a wary eye down at the hollow who had apparently completely lost it. He hasn't managed to hit me with a zero yet, which means I'd be completely fine if I just remain up here and avoid his attacks. He's being completely ruled by his emotions at the moment, so all the bat hollow's train of thought was cut off when out of nowhere Naruto appeared in front of him. What? He yelled before Naruto delivered to him a devastating slash across the torso. The bat hollow coughed up more blood, before Naruto shot out his paw and kicked the hollow in his wound. The bat hollow was sent careening down to earth, red blood flying into the air in torrents. He slammed face first into a giant rock wall a distance away, and weakly lied there, hoping that his high-speed regeneration would kick in fast enough. Unfortunately for him, that wasn't what happened, because Naruto flashed into existence in front of him in a matter of seconds. The fox hovered over the other hollow like a fierce, tribal god. His hot anger had given way to cold rage, and the bat was left wondering if his trivial actions had really angered him that much. If that was the case, then this hollow was an anomaly. Naruto seemed to realize that he would heal in time, so before that could happen, he picked up the slightly smaller hollow by the head, holding the limp being at arm's length and scrutinizing him closely. The other hollow grit his teeth, becoming very wary of what was to come. Naruto didn't say a word. No, didn't even make a sound as he smashed the poor hollow's face into the rock, over and over again. Every time he did it he thrust harder, and every time he did it his victim bled more. Yet, through all of this, he never made a sound. Not even a noise of pleasure came from Naruto's mouth, and all that could be heard was the low grunting coming from the brutalized hollow. The grunts calmed him, however. Soon, all his feelings of anger dissipated and the familiar calm mind settled over his entire being again. Only his muscle reflex kept him bashing the other hollow against the wall. Naruto's mind, on the other hand, was working rationally again. Naruto's bashing went to a sudden halt, and the young hollow dropped his opponent roughly to fall into the sand. His eyes were completely blank, and he continued staring off into space for another thirty seconds. The cogs in Naruto's mind seemed to be working at an extra great performance today as a ludicrous smile made its way onto his face when he came onto one of his most brilliant ideas to date. His head creaked and turned over to his right, 
where he set his malicious gaze on the downed hollow who was just now crawling to lie on his back. The hollow caught Naruto's gaze again, and vaguely wondered what he had in mind now. The hollow didn't have to wait to be answered, as Naruto placed his sharp claws at his neck, and didn't retract them. It didn't matter what Miracle's high-speed regeneration could perform now, one strike there and he was dead. The hollow's breathing increased slightly, and Naruto grinned at the fact that he had managed to get under his opponent's skin at least a little. Don't move. I've just given you a chance to escape from this predicament alive. It wouldn't do for you to make any sudden moves, now would it? He threatened. The bat hollow sighed slightly. What do you want? A common conception of a hostage. They believe that their captors always want something. But what I want isn't what's at stake here. Tell me, my fellow Ajuchas, do you want to see the sunset? He asked. I don't really under the bat hollow started. What I mean is, do you want to see a change in the drab, empty lifestyle that you hold in such high regard? Said Naruto, his voice laced with sarcasm. The bat hollow's green eyes widened at that, trying to wrap his mind around what it was implying. The meaning in your life that was so wrongly taken away from you. Do you want it back? I can give you meaning to your life my fellow Ajuchas. I am going to take this world by storm with my power, but I can't do it alone. I need a suitable lieutenant, a right-hand man, if you will. Well, would you be interested in being the champion to a future king of Hueco Mundo, an eventual destroying of the Shinigami? Naruto asked. The bad hollow's eyes widened even further, to the point that there was a great deal of emotion on the normally stoic hollow's face. Destroy the Shinigami? You must be insane. Such a task would require a great deal of power, far beyond something you or I could. I'm going to do it. With my armies, we will crush Suriidei. It doesn't sound like too bad of a deal, does it? As my second in command, you would have almost complete control over them, not to mention the other denizens of my kingdom. I'm giving you the chance to lord over other hollows, Naruto said, trying to sweeten the deal. So why don't you do yourself a favor and take it? I can guarantee you will not regret it, he finished. The bad hollow eyed Naruto thoughtfully, from his posture to his expression and to his words. Whatever the case, all of those seemed genuine. He wasn't lying, his eyes could see that much. He truly believed he could fulfill all of this. Hmph. The bad hollow started. His tone was now clipped. If you believe you can win me over with promises of grandeur and social status, then you are sorely mistaken. My empty heart will not respond to those things at this point in time. Naruto grimaced at the emo words. However, I have long grown tired of this lifestyle, and if you believe you can bring meaning to this hollow, then I am tempted to accept your offer. And despite my demeanor, I am far from fond of the Shinigami, and I would not be sad to see them be destroyed. Naruto grinned. He clearly liked where this was going. The bat hollow mulled the thought over once again, closing his eyes for roughly a minute before speaking again. Very well. I accept the position of your second in command and your subordinate. I swear that I shall follow you until the day I die, and perform any orders you may have without question, as long as you give my life some sense of meaning. The other Ajuchas recited. Naruto removed his claws from the other hollow's throat before doing a raucous little celebratory jig. The bat hollow massaged his neck while climbing to his feet, his high-speed regeneration already taking care of his previous injuries inflicted by his new lord. Already he was wondering what he had gotten himself into. Well, my fellow Ajuchas, I hope you realize that you are now fully in the service of the future Hueco Mundo King Naruto Uzumaki. For starters, you must tell me the name of my second-in-command and first vassal he shouted. The bat hollow looked at him, his stoic expression on his face again. His new king was staring at him intensely, like he just couldn't get over the fact that he had a subordinate now. The hollow closed his eyes and cleared his throat, and opened his mouth to speak two words. Alquiora Cipher. 